thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank SCAR team and organizing committee for providing me opportunity to discuss our recent results. So I'm going to present on spatial and seasonal variations in black carbon over the Antarctic region in a regional climate model simulation. So the outline of the talk, first, this is so first talk of the session. So I would like to introduce what are the aerosols from where they come and why they are significant in climate change research. Then what are the scientific challenges involved in the aerosol research, mainly over polar regions. Then I will come to the objectives of the talk. Then what are the model, what is the model used and what are the data used in this model simulations? And then I will describe some of the initial results which we got from regional climate modeling simulation. And finally, I will summarize my talk. So aerosols, most of us know, know about aerosol. Aerosols are solid, tiny particles or liquid droplets which are suspended in air medium, uh, having size range of 0.001 to 10 micron. They have both natural and anthropogenic origin. In natural origin, aerosols are mainly produced by wind blown dust, um, sea salt coming from breaking of sea waves, and then forest fire. These are main uh, sources which produce national, um, sorry, natural aerosols. In the second case, anthropogenic origin, we are mainly vehicular exhaust, industrial exhaust, and crop residue burning are main aerosols. As far as their optics are concerned, aerosols are categorized in two sections. First is scattering aerosols in that sulfate and sea salt aerosols are main. And absorbing aerosols were mainly black carbon aerosol present, which is the main topic of the present study. So why we should study aerosol? So they are important component of global climate change. So we know that the primary source of energy is sun. So solar radiations reaches to ground by passing through different layers of the atmosphere. So aerosol present in the atmosphere, they absorb these solar radiations and, and scatter also depending on which type of aerosol present in the atmosphere. They also uh, scatter and absorb the reflected radiation from the earth's surface. In this way, they affect the earth atmosphere radiation balance and earth energy budget, which finally lead to change in the climate. This is called direct effect of aerosols. Aerosols have indirect effect also, where aerosol act as a cloud seed. So when aerosol, depending on which type of aerosol, their size, their type present in the aerosol, they change the microphysical properties of the cloud. In this way, they affect the lifetime of the cloud and their precipitation. So directly they are reducing or changing the ground reaching radiation. This is and acting as a cloud seeding, they also affect the ground reaching radiation by more back scattering um, from the cloud tops. So these are two direct and indirect effects. There is a semi-direct effect is also there. When this absorbing black carbon aerosol present at cloud level height, they absorb the radiation and warm that layer. And this way that cloud vaporize, that is called burn off effect. So they affect the radiative balance and climate. With, with this brief introduction of aerosol, I will come to the why this research is challenging. So here, what I have shown, the famous diagram of IPCC 2013 report. Here you can see this is the radiative forcing component. Radiative forcing is nothing but if you consider two atmosphere, in first atmosphere, we have that uh, component. In the second is the clear atmosphere. We don't have that component, for example, the aerosol in present and aerosol of scent. You take the difference, you will get the radiative forcing. But in IPCC, there is a difference that uh, they, they assume that pre-industrial and post-industrial. So uh, that post-industrial minus pre-industrial will give you the radiative forcing. 
So here you can see that well mixed gas, they are mostly showing positive forcing, means they are warming the climate system. That is well known. If you come to the aerosol part, which is the main focus of this study, so you can see all the aerosol mostly uh, cooling the system because zero line is this. So the left side is showing the cooling. So aerosol mostly cooling the system. But if you see black carbon, which is showing the positive effect, positive rate of forcing, and in addition, black carbon present over snow still shows more warming. And the level of uncertainty is still very high because we have less understanding of parameterizations of aerosol. We have let less observations. Uh, if you see over the polar region, aerosols mainly, uh, if you see the peak is uh, short wave radiation. So uh, snow surface has higher reflectance in the short wave range. So aerosol present in that range cannot be detected using remote sensing satellite study because that uh, most of the back reflector radiation is very high when compared to the aerosol signal. So that is the main challenge to measure these aerosols from the satellite over the snow covered surface. So we have less scientific understanding. So we require more research on in this field in order to, in order to predict climate more efficiently. So with this challenge, basic uh, motivation of uh, this research, uh, I, would, I will come to objective part. Uh, so objective is to investigate weather research and for, uh, forecasting model with coupled with chemistry simulations, mostly aerosol and black carbon simulations, and to study how they are spatially varying and seasonally how they are changing in the Antarctic region. So we did with using this WRF chem simulation, we used uh, version four model, WRF chem four, uh, version four model. So if in order to run model, we require some boundary conditions. So for this, we used this NCEF FNL one degree by one degree grid cis hourly data. Then we have this biogenic emissions uh, of Megan, then fire emissions uh, with one kilometer by one kilometer and anthropogenic emissions that is HR, HTAP. Uh, which is 0 0.01 to 1, 0 0.01 by 0 0.01 degree greater resolution. And in addition to this initial and lateral, lateral boundary condition of chemical field, which are obtained from uh, this CAM, community atmosphere model with chemistry, CAM, CHEM at greater resolution of 1.875 by 1.2 degree. So these this data we used to run the model, uh, WRF CHEM model simulation. In addition, we selected some schemes based on the comparison. Uh, so boundary layer scheme, we have used uh, Yonsai University scheme. Then uh, we have used cumulus parameterization, GF, uh, microphysics scheme, Morrison double moment scheme, then gas phase chemistry, we have used Mozart and aerosol mechanism from Gokart. So with this basic introduction of model, I will come to the emission part. So here I have shown how HR, this HR emission, anthropogenic emission is looks like over the whole globe. So you can here see that uh, higher resistance, uh, higher uh, values of black carbon emission over Asian region and African region also. Uh, some part of US and region uh, is also showing high value. And these lines you are seeing that is ship cruise emissions, which are also considered in this. But if you see mostly emission over near the Antarctic region, it's uh, very less or may not be included in the uh, these emissions because of uh, less observations and measurement. Now uh, I will come to the result part. Here uh, the temperature we have shown two contrasting seasons: summer, means austral summer, and austral winter. So December, January, February is austral summer. June, July, August, September is winter. So here we can see that temperature, we can, the model can simulate uh, pretty good. We can see that lower values in winter, my, more than minus 55. And Eastern part of Antarctica is showing more cooling when compared to the Western part. So this type of thing is resemblance to the observation. 
I will come to the relative humidity. This is also important because this aerosol goes in um, higher relative humidity presence. So you can see here uh, this relative humidity mainly in ice sheet is not captured because it should show uh, in observation it is showing that very high saturation more than 90 percent value but model is not able to capture uh, the this region but coastal region it is capturing the uh, relative humidity with respect to observations now i will come to the black carbon spatial variations so uh, if you see the absolute value here it's very less model is not able to capture the absolute value it's about order of magnitude less but uh, if you see spatial uh, seasonal pattern the higher values in winter austral winter can be uh, of the uh, found in the model and you can see that coastal region is showing mostly higher value when compared to the central arctic region so these uh, uh, these part is due to because of uh, fire counts also and uh, as well as the anthropogenic activities so two mainly, minutes left through it yeah mainly you can see that fire counts are in june july august september is more in the southern hemispheric region as well as northern also so th that fire emits the biomass burning ca carbon that is black carbon so that could lead to higher aerosol BC mass concentration over the Antarctic region in wind, austral winter. But still values are less, so we need more observations and we have to improve the model in order to uh, predict black carbon over this region. Now, since we have very less observations, uh, India has two stations uh, in the Antarctic. So under this polar aerosol network program, we have a similar set of observations, aerosol observations over different polar region uh, is initiated in polar net. So from 2019, data is collected. Uh, after this talk, Dr. Anand Singh will be going to present on this results of black carbon over the uh, Indian stations. In this network, we uh, Southern Ocean region is also included and we have done one uh, cruise in 2020, uh, which reached to near the Antarctic coast, and we found higher values of uh, black carbon over this region. Uh, this network also uh, have uh, objective to collaborate with organizations having aerosol measurements so that we can have very good database of spatial variations of aerosol based on in situ observation because satellite observations of aerosol have lots of uncertainties so we require in situ observation in order to validate the model results uh, some places where this snow is not there satellite data will also be included in the uh, polar net program in order to understand spatial and temporal variations of aerosols in the polar region and how they are interacting with the climate how they are changing uh, this critical to the climate and what are their impact in terms of radiative forcing changing in heating rate all this will be this, uh, studied in this polar net program so Can now you please, uh, finish up uh, i will summarize the talk uh, aerosol influence significantly earth uh, uh, affecting the uh, earth atmosphere additive balance wrfk model used to simulate so it is able to simulate the spatial and seasonal variation of temperature but uh, rh part only uh, coastal region is simulated well but uh, within that sheet uh, is not uh, central antarctic region it is not simulating well uh, spatial variations, seasonal variations of BC mass concentrations is simulated, but the absolute value is uh, order of magnitude low. In order to understand the aerosol variability or Antarctic measurement at different locations, measurements are required. So that's why we are planning the polar, air, polar, polar aerosol network. With this, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer in question answer session. Thank you.
Thank you, Rohit. That was really nice. Nice to see some uh, initial early work uh, on WARF uh, going on at NCPR. I'm hoping there'll be some exciting results in the future. Uh, we will do a question answer session uh, after the first four slotted talk. So if you have any questions, please uh, save them for that. Or of course, you're more than welcome to put any questions into the Q&A box, which can be answered live. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next talk, which mm -hmm. is in continuation with this one, uh, which is uh, uh, focusing on BC observations at the Indian Antarctic. Uh, basis. So, Anand, please share your screen and uh, start your talk. Sorry, Anand, can you go full screen? And we can't hear you either. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now. Okay. Yeah, uh, but uh, the uh, the presentation is still not on full screen. Yes, yes, okay. that's fine. That's fine. Please go ahead. Right. So, uh, thank you, Rohit, for a uh, wonderful presentation, and more importantly, covering the introduction part. So, I'll be skip skipping the uh, introduction related to aerosols. So this presentation is basically, as Rohit was saying, that uh, uh, we have two observatories in Antarctica where we are uh, doing our full uh, observations year round, uh, starting at, after summer 2018-19. So uh, in this, uh, we have uh, athelometer for black carbon uh, concentration monitoring. We have particle sizer for the particle range in the range of uh, 0.5 to 20 micron nephelometer for uh, particulate scattering and sulfurometer for aerosol optical depth. So a little uh, background for uh, the observatories. Uh, the two Indian facilities in Antarctica are about uh, 3,000 kilometers apart, one in central Donium Moorland and the other one is in uh, Las Hills area. So Matri is about 100 kilometer inland, as you can see on the right. Uh, it's about 100 kilometer inland on the Shimaka Oasis, while Las Hills is a coastal station. Bhartu station on the Larsman Hills is a coastal station. So what we see here that uh, uh, at uh, Larsman Hills where Bhartu station is located, there are two more stations of uh, uh, China and uh, Russia, Zonshang and Progress. These stations are located. And we see the predominant wind direction looks like that. Uh, uh, this is one year uh, data of uh, uh, automatic weather station at uh, Bharti. So we see that uh, during the predominant wind direction, mostly the exhaust from Zhongshan and Progress might be reaching to Bharti. And also the summer facility runway, which operates intermittently, that also uh, generates a lot of uh, uh, black carbon due to fossil fuel burning. As such, there are no known sources of uh, uh, wildfire or uh, biomass burning in Antarctica, or especially at these stations. This one is for uh, Matri, so a neighboring station of uh, Russia, which is called Novo. It's about five kilometers. And again, this is in the uh, upwind direction, and this might be bringing up some uh, station exhaust to Matri, where we have the observation facility. And also the runway, which is about 10 kilometers, a uh, little off in, in south direction. So this presentation is basically focused on the black carbon observations, which is uh, carried out at Mathri as well as Bharti using uh, Maggi Scientific A33 uh, ethylometer. This is based on uh, light scattering in seven different channels, and particularly the uh, wavelength, uh, and basically the attenuation of the light through uh, the filter. And the one which is at 880 nanometer that uh, basically gets the black carbon concentration. And a33 is also capable of uh, giving giving the portion of uh, black uh, of uh, biomass burning and how much the percentage in the black carbon monitored by the instrument is due to uh, biomass burning. So, uh, as Rohit was also saying that uh, uh, the instrumental capability is uh, still limited for monitoring the uh, black carbon in pristine Antarctic environment. So there have been 
there have not been many significant works on uh, black carbon in Antarctica. Uh, however, there are there are few. So one uh, uh, by Cordero uh, in in the recent part in, in the recent year, uh, they show that uh, the black carbon in the Antarctic Peninsula is increasing, and that is about uh, say four to five nanogram per uh, gram of uh, uh, spice, basically snow, basically. So that's what they uh, did, and uh, they say. Recently, uh, Hara et al. They, uh, reported about uh, 10 years observations of black carbon at uh, Showa station, which is uh, halfway between Matthew and Bhatri stations. And they report that uh, black carbon varies with season, like uh, uh, Rohit was showing in her page, uh, earlier presentation, uh, captured by model. So what we can see that uh, during July, August, and September, which is close to uh, winter uh, months in Antarctica, so we see that the concentration of black carbon increases. And uh, uh, using the black back uh, trajectory model, they suggest that uh, during the September or August when a wildfire in the Southern Hemisphere peaks up, uh, the wind appears to uh, uh, come to show off station uh, from uh, the neighboring uh, regions. Unlike what we see in the left uh, from in, in January month. Also, there have been uh, studies from uh, uh, the, uh, our Indian colleagues that uh, uh, the local factors like blizzards, uh, they scavenge the uh, black carbon, and during blizzard there is a significant drop in the black carbon concentration. So I'm coming back to uh, the uh, analysis part of the data. So there is the instrument works very close to the sensitivity limit, and uh, it's tricky to uh, analyze the data. So there are at least two schools of thoughts. One that uh, the black carbon concentration reported by ethylometer it goes negative at uh, one minute cadence. So the one school of thought that uh, ignore the negative values and just consider the positive values, however, leads to uh, positive bias. This is one day data, what we see in blue color uh, for August 1, 2019 for Bharti station. And the second one is that average out everything and uh, still you will find some positive values. So there will be uh, lesser concentration. So here we see, uh, how a monthly average uh, black carbon concentration, the diurnal pattern basically for uh, about one and a half years data. So we clearly see that uh, there is a diurnal pattern which is uh, the black carbon concentration maximized during local noon. And it appears to uh, have relation with the uh, uh, diurnal trend basically. And in, in this and the uh, subsequent slides, what we have done that uh, the time when station exhaust of Bharti or method doesn't reach to the laboratory, those instances have been taken for uh, uh, analyzing data, reporting, whatever is shown here. So what we see here on the left, that uh, uh, daily variation in the black carbon concentration at uh, Bharti in the left top and in the bottom uh, at Mathri. So we can see that uh, during May, June months, uh, there is significant uh, reduction in the black carbon concentration. Whereas during the summer, uh, on the right side, uh, this is more clear. Uh, during the summer months, uh, probably it's uh, due to the local activity which is taking place uh, at uh, Bharti and other stations due to enhanced activity, there is higher concentration of black carbon. Nevertheless, there is uh, again a secondary peak in September, August, September, and October months, which is which basically coincide with the uh, wildfire in the Southern Hemisphere. As I said, that uh, the thermometer can also uh, report the uh, fraction of uh, biomass burning. So what we see here uh, on daily scale in the left panels for Bharti and Matri, and for monthly scale uh, again on the right. So we see that uh, the times when uh, the black carbon concentration decreases. That is the time when, or uh, that, that is the time when uh, the concentration or the fraction of the uh, biomass burning increases. So it appears like, uh, I mean, there are no known sources for biomass uh, burning uh, at uh, neighboring stations or at Bharti. So this should be ideally uh, due to uh, the natural uh, sources what are coming from uh, the southern hemisphere. So we also uh, tried to see the uh, back trajectory for uh, 
three different months of January, May, and September. And uh, if you can see the plot for Mathri and Bharti, Bharti on the top and Mathri on the uh, bottom. So for January, we, we can see that uh, the wind comes from very uh, nearby uh, places around Antarctica. Whereas during May and more so during September on the rightmost panel, the wind uh, appears to reach from all around the coast, all around Antarctic and uh, the coast, so which might be bringing uh, the uh, black carbon, basically uh, the biomass from uh, the southern hemisphere, uh, wherever we have vegetation. So with this, I uh, uh, stop this presentation and uh, open for any discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anand. Uh, it's nice to see these observations. I, I, I'm really hoping to see the comparison with the model in the future. Uh, with that, uh, our next speaker, Atiba Sheikh, she's not going to be uh, available. She just had like a surgery and, and is unfortunately not available. Uh, however, we can go into the question answer sessions uh, because we have a few questions and after which we'll take the next uh, next collection of talks. Uh, David uh, Murphy, uh, just a reminder saying that uh, I've invited you to join as a panelist. You'll need to join in order to present your presentation after the question and answer session. Uh, with that, uh, there are a couple of questions. The first question is by Nuncio, and he's asking, does Antarctica show any response to anthropogenic black carbon? I'm assuming this is for Rohit. So Rohit, can you please uh, answer that? Yes, as, as Dr. Anand shows that uh, there's a biomass burning and fossil fuel, there are two components of uh, black carbon, biomass burning and fossil fuel. So whenever we can see mostly uh, biomass burning is 20 to 30 percent percent in his car, uh, contribution of biomass burning. So the rest is the fossil fuel means mostly anthropogenic origin. So anthropogenic aerosols dominate over the Antarctic. Sorry, uh, so you're, you're saying the anthropogenic forcing will dominate over natural forcing, but do you have a quantification on that by any chance? Yeah, actually, um, that uh, you ha that Dr. Anand shows that plot uh, biomass burning. So if you, and there are two component is considered while calculation is contribution of biomass burning using ethylometer. One is the um, biomass burning contribution. Second one is the fossil fuel burn, uh, combustion contribution. So we, you, uh, while the presentation you have seen that uh, it's about 20 to 30 percent only the biomass burning contribution because there's no uh, this forest fire or biomass burning source which can uh, have a large means huge transport of black carbon over the region so mostly it's the fossil fuel uh, uh, aerosols which are uh, either transported through shipping path or maybe uh, nearby uh, land region there is the kargulian island and other islands are also there where establishments are there so that can also transport and some research bases are there so that that can also reach to the uh, antarctic region yeah. yeah no i don't think the question is about the sources the question is the response uh, do you do you in the model see any response to anthropogenic black carbon in terms of radiative forcing or in terms of any other effects? No, that... actually, uh, this is very initial result. First, we have to validate, then we can come to the uh, this response of uh, fossil fuel. No doubt fossil fuel response will be high because their concentration is high. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions that uh, uh, anyone has? If not, I have uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, this is for... Anand, Anand, uh, these observations are pretty exciting. Uh, you know, it's nice to see some some black carbon observations made at the Indian stations. However, uh, there are, I mean, you you clearly have a signal from the other stations, uh, which is affecting your observations. So, uh, have you have you co compared your observations with any observations at the Chinese or Australian basis to see whether there is a baseline that you measure at any point at all, or is it always going to be contaminated? Uh Anup, unfortunately, data from uh, the Chinese station is not available in public domain and they do not generally share. And uh, Russian stations, they do not have any uh, similar observations. However, if I see that uh, how uh, the show of station, which is close by, the, they show almost pretty much similar trend, what we observe. So it looks like uh, considering that uh, the sources are pretty much uh, same around the year, at least uh, after the summer activity over the Antarctica. So I believe that uh, what we observe uh, that is due to uh, actually variations in uh, in the black carbon. 
Okay, so basically you're able to filter out any any direct exhaust from the stations very easily to see the see the background. Right, apparently, yes. Okay, that's very good news. Uh, the other thing is, why do you see a noon peak? Uh, right, and it's probably uh, the way the way the troposphere behaves with the, uh, during the noon. Uh, we are we are yet to uh, I mean uh, consolidate uh, what could be the uh, probable reasons, but similar trend is observed in uh, uh, several other uh, particle observations. So it is very much there, like in uh, uh, the space charge, uh, the electrons and protons have similar diagonal trend. So what appears is related to the atmospheric variations. That is very interesting. Uh, that that peak is not something I would have uh, expected, but yeah, that's uh, interesting to see. Uh, any other questions from uh, anybody else? Uh, I think somebody else had a question. Ma Mark, you had a question, right? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions that are related to both of the uh, the speakers. Um, so I might start with the uh, with Rohit. The the Edgar HTAP, which has the um, the anthropogenic emissions, you showed a plot one or two slides after you introduced that, where you showed the black carbon emissions, and you you pointed out that around Antarctica and the Southern Ocean there was basically uh, nothing. But I'm I'm wondering if the ships from the icebreakers and uh, tourist ships and the stations are included in that at all. And if they are not, then maybe the measurements that Anan showed in the second presentation are a useful way to, to estimate the contribution of black carbon from these Antarctic stations to feed into your model. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that. You're on mute, really. Yes, actually, this emission inventories needs to be updated, modified with uh, recent observations. And uh, this should include observations. Even I told that there is a one small base is that Kalgurian Island is there, German base station is there. So that emissions is not captured. That uh, that should be included in order to predict uh, uh, black carbon, accurate black carbon mm, concentration over the Antarctic region. So that if that is included, then model value, which is showing very less, even the order of magnitude less, uh, one or two we are getting, but here uh, uh, that in observation 10, 10 to 25 to 10 or 10 20 we got so that that will be resolved once this uh, emissions is included near the antarctic region yeah. but measure, measurement near the antarctic region is really challenging so that's what that is not included i think yes okay thank you um and then my second question was for anand is the you showed that you estimate that i think you said 20 to 30 percent of the black carbon was coming from biomass burning. Um, and, you know, there are significant fires in Africa and South America and Australia every year. I'm wondering if you've been able to say anything about which continent those that that uh, the biomass burning aerosol is coming from. I would sus suspect it's Africa, but I'm wondering if you've got any um, any evidence to, to sort of figure that out. Uh, yes, Mark. Uh... Uh, the back trajectory model, what we run, and also uh, Hara and his colleagues, what they have shown, they they identify that uh, the wind which uh, reaches to uh, this part of Antarctica, basically Mathri, Bharti, and uh, the inter uh, intermediate station uh, Shoa, the wind basically comes from uh, the South America and Africa. So yep. they are they are the uh, parts of the con uh, world which uh, contribute to black carbon uh, variation at. Uh, the, the locations. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Any more questions or? Yeah. So, uh, if anybody else uh, else has a question, I can see in, uh, there's another question which Nuncio has asked. Uh, he's asking, does the observed changes in aerosol can impact Antarctic precipitation? So, do the do you think uh, the observed changes in aerosols will impact precipitation? And I assume this will be for Rohit. Yes, it will because as I told that uh, aerosol can act as a cloud seed. So, without aerosol, you cannot expect cloud and cloud. Out to rain conversion is also depends on aerosol. If uh, hygroscopic aerosol present in the cloud, they can uh, grow in their size in in the within the cloud and uh, convert cloud to rain. 
and precipitation will enhance. But if a hydrophobic aerosols such as these black carbons or fine aerosols are present in the cloud, they repel cloud droplet to police and form a uh, liquid droplet. So in this way, they repel the precipitation. So no doubt aerosols have great role in converting from cloud to rain. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, Damon, you have your hand up. Uh, do you want to ask your question? Um, yes, thank you. Um, Rohit, um, apologies if this is not a sensible question because I know very little about aerosols and black carbon, but um, I'm interested. You said in your um, discussion of the Polera net uh, network that you hoped to expand your observations um, out um, to the Southern Ocean. Um, I'm interested in, in how you can do that. Is there a satellite product or are you relying on? Um, uh, on ships or um, yeah. you, could you could you speak to that? Yeah. Uh, so actually, India has Indian uh, Southern Ocean expedition during um, astral summer, mostly January. So we send our these all these instrument, black carbon measurement, scattering, APS size distribution measurement on this cruise, and that cruise is near the Antarctica coast. So that uh, observations is there, but that is only for a particular season, not throughout, but still we are planning how we can have year long uh, observations of aerosol uh, from the Southern Ocean, but still it's very challenging, yeah. So if I can just make a follow up um, comment to that and and um, Mark may wanna um, add to what I say because he um, knows more about this, but our new icebreaker, the Noyina, which, um, we hope to come into full service um, in the next, probably next, not the coming season, but the season after. Um, our, our, our plan is to have an extensive aerosol laboratory on the Noyena that um, uh, could be making quite complementary observations. So um, uh, that that may, you know, it may, it may be uh, useful and and uh, and a target for for future cooperation between uh, between India and Australia's uh, Antarctic programs. Yeah. Definitely, we we'll welcome the collaborations because the one of the objective of Polar Aeronet is that to collaborate and collect, uh, have a, all these aerosol data over a, a same platform so that modelers can utilize it and validate these uh, aerosol uh, with these observations to their model and predict the future uh, climate prediction projections or predictions both. So it will be very useful that we should collaborate and have a good database over the Antarctic region where uh, measurement is still very challenging. Thank you. We'll definitely collaborate and have good data. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Damien and, and Rohit. Uh, Rohit, one more question. So you mentioned uh, the emissions not being very correct, uh, yes. which is obviously a big problem down yes. south because yeah. there are very few uh, validated emission inventories. Uh, how do you plan to improve it? Uh, you know, by making a couple of observations yeah. uh, on cruises, it's it's a little difficult to update yeah. an entire emission inventory, right? Yeah, definitely it's uh, in there, but uh, uh, means uh, how we can have measurement near the oceanic region, that's a really challenge. But uh, this Bharti and Matri, we have year long observation, that's why we, plant this uh, polar net so that we can have year long observations under the polar net. Uh, we can just, uh, uh, we can collaborate with the other who have these measurements. So once this all year long measurements are available that can be used as uh, uh, this uh, in improving the uh, emission inventory. We are also planning that chemical measurements using high volume sampler so that we can have in addition to black carbon dust, sulfate, sea salt, all measurements we can plan. So it's just developing phase, just 2019 we started, but after that this COVID happened, so we cannot progress, but whatever is the long-term observation that is continuing, and still we are having our measurements. Yeah, one, maybe one good thing to do is uh, ask the model, what are the emissions you need? Yeah. And then, then see whether you can validate them at a couple of uh, stations, right? Uh, yeah. That might really help you move a step ahead rather than waiting for observations to build up. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? If you have any, please uh, type uh, out your questions in the Q and A. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes, so we can we can definitely uh, uh, get some more answers. I will ask one more question, if uh, since we have time and there is sure. anything yes. open in the Q and A. 
I was wondering how useful ice core measurements of black carbon could be in trying to figure out this whole problem yes. of uh, how black carbon has changed. Have you looked at uh, any ice core record, recent ice core records? Uh, actually, uh, we have this ice core, but uh, for black carbon, we didn't. Dip. We did for this dust. So we got that uh, recently. Our paper, our group paper, came in uh, JGR that uh, showing that enhancement of dust. But still, we have to uh, do this for black carbon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it will be very interesting to see whether we are starting to see big changes in the BC concentrations. Uh, I, I, I don't have an answer to that because it seems like wildfires are the ones which are contributing quite a lot to, to this, right? But it will be interesting. Very nice, very exciting to see these observations and, and modeling efforts. Okay, mm -hmm. with that, uh, considering we have about five minutes uh, for uh, the next uh, talk, we can probably start off because uh, then we can give the speakers a little bit more time. So David Murphy, uh, you are around, I see. Uh, if you want to share your screen and uh, and maybe we can start off with your talk a little earlier so that you can take a little more time. Uh, can you also unmute your microphone so that we can hear you? Yeah, I can see your screen, if you can go full screen. And also unmute your microphone because I can't hear you as yet. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Wonderful, okay, let's try this again here. I was trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> All right. So uh, basically, it was supposed to be 10 minutes, but you can take up to 12 minutes if you want. We, we've got a little more time. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, thank you uh, for, for, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is David Murphy. I'm at the University of South Florida in uh, mechanical engineering. Today, today I'd like to talk about uh, my, my talk will be very mechanistic and um, um, uh, it's about a, a novel source of um, uh, aerosols, which could be operative in the, in the poles. Um, and I should start off and say I'm not, I'm not an expert in uh, climate science or meteorology, so I'd, I'd be welcome, uh, I'd welcome comments from folks in, uh, who are experts in those areas. Okay, uh, so a bit of background first. We all know that um, aerosols uh, are very important. Uh, they impact the climate both through uh, a direct route by blocking um, incoming solar radiation as well as uh, an indirect route uh, by serving as cloud condensation nuclei and ice nucleating particles um, so they can both uh, cool the planet and, and warm the planet in that route. However, um, uh, global, global climate models don't really capture uh, aerosol concentrations all that well, uh, particularly, particularly at the poles. Um, and this is a problem since um, aerosols represent the largest source of uncertainty in those models. So what's really needed is a, a better understanding of, of where these aerosols are coming from, especially primary aerosols, uh, such as marine aerosol, or, which is also known as sea salt aerosol. Um, so over the open ocean, we have a pretty good handle on how uh, marine aerosol is formed. Uh, we know that um, uh, wind waves are formed and they, they break um, as white caps. Uh, as they do so, they entrain air. <clears throat> and <clears throat> these air bubbles then float back up to the surface. Uh, where they then burst, and depending on the size of the bubble, they can create different kinds and, and numbers of, of jet of, of droplets, which then form different kinds of, of aerosol uh, particles. So, for example, here on the left, we see uh, a large a large bubble, which um, uh, when it bursts, the film disintegrates into to form these film droplets. Um, so that's one source. Uh, but for much more for much smaller bubbles, such as these um, much more submerged bubble on the right hand side. Um, those burst, and then that bubble cavity collapses upwards to form this uh, jet drop, as you can see see here. And we've uh, we visualized the airflow coming out of that bubble by uh, ejecting smoke into the bubble. Um, so these are, you know, this, these are well-known sources of, of marine aerosol operating over the open ocean, and these have been well parameterized for, for global models. But in 
polar regions, we don't have quite as good of an idea of how this of how this works. Um, there's you know there's there's sea ice, and so sea ice often prevents uh, wave formation, and so you would expect that there would be fewer bubbles. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting though, because we see that with increasing sea ice, we see um, increased um, aerosol production. So in periods uh, such as the winter and spring, when there is uh, there's more ice around, uh, we actually see uh, local maxima in, um, in aerosol concentrations. And so there's this idea that sea ice, sea ice is somehow contributing to uh, marine aerosol production in polar regions, such as the Arctic and Antarctic, uh, but we don't quite know how that's, uh, how that's happening. Um, no, we do have a few ideas. Uh, a few ideas have been suggested over the past uh, 20 or so years. Um, one of these is, is frost flowers, which are these uh, vapor uh, deposition grown um, salty ice crystals which form on sea ice. And so it was suggested about 20 years ago that, that these might uh, break off in high wind situations then be lofted up or suspended in the atmosphere um, and that these could contribute to uh, marine aerosol. That hasn't really panned out. Um, it seems like that's not really the case. There's, there's not quite enough of them. Um, they don't have quite a wide extent. Um, so that's probably not the answer here or, or a small contributor perhaps. A second option is, uh, is blowing snow sublimation. Uh, so in this case, snow that settles on sea ice is, uh, is uh, lofted, it's suspended, uh, saltated first and then suspended in the atmosphere. Uh, by high winds, and then um, in low humidity conditions, those uh, the snow particles will sublime and leave behind their, their nucleus particle, which serves as marine aerosol. And this uh, this has been backed up by observations, um, particularly those by uh, Frey et al. Um, in, the, in the Weddell Sea. Um, I'd like to focus on the third option, which is that um, bubble bursting um, in, in leads and polynias and open waters around the Southern Ocean might still be contributing significantly to uh, marine aerosol production. Um, and, um, and so um, but the question then is, you know, if you have these narrow leads, such as this, uh, this example of this uh, image from NASA, um, well, you know, these, this lead is pretty narrow. You don't have a lot of uh, room for, uh, uh, for wind waves to occur. The fetch is, is really quite small. And so then the question is, well, where, where would bubbles be coming from um, in, in these, in these uh, narrow openings? Um, and so that's sort of the goal of, of my talk is to investigate alternative mechanisms of bubble production and open leads. <clears throat> and so the proposed model that I look to, like to put forward as, a, as an option for um, marine aerosol creation and bubble creation is, um, it, it hinges on this observation that snow particles contain air cavities. So if you you take a micrograph or a high, high magnification photograph of a, a real snowflake or no, a real snow a crystal, you'll see that a lot of them have these um, air cavities inside of them. So for example, on the left, we see this columnar uh, snow crystal with these two, symmetric, um, uh, these two symmetric air cavities inside of it. Um, here we have another example. This is a sort of a melting snow crystal and you see this sheath-like um, air, uh, air cavity inside of this, uh, inside of this crystal. So this seems to be a pretty common occurrence, although I haven't been able to find any um, any statistics in the literature on how often this occurs. Um, but um, so my basic proposed model looks something like this. So we can have um, as one option uh, freshly falling snowflakes, which uh, fall from the sky, uh, fall into um, uh, areas of open water uh, and open lead. Um, these uh, snowflakes will uh, cross the air water interface, uh, melt. Release those micro bubbles. The micro bubbles can then float back up to the surface, where, they'll, where they will burst, and then uh, generate primary aerosol. Most likely, it's jet droplets, since those air bubbles are so small. Um, alternatively, and probably more commonly, um, wind would be able to pick up um, uh, snow particles from uh, from sea from sea ice, and so these particles could saltate uh, or be uh, or be suspended, and then eventually fall into an open lead. Um, or, or polynia, where again, the same process would occur. So these, these particles would um, cross the air-water interface, melt, and release the bubbles. Um, those bubbles would float back to the surface burst and, and generate primary aer aerosol in that, in that way. Now, I have some uh, preliminary data that sort of uh, backs up this, this theory here. This is just uh, observations with, with, from a snowstorm in uh, Baltimore a few years ago when I was a postdoc back there. So we essentially had a... <clears throat> A small acrylic uh, aquarium uh, with a high-speed camera, and we set up set up both of these on the threshold 
of a door to the outside, uh, to the outside where the snow was falling. And so this, um, this acrylic aquarium was filled with um, uh, artificial seawater at a salinity of um, about, about 33 PBT and a temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius. And so we set up this, uh, this high-speed camera, which was filming at 500 frames per second at uh, four megapixel resolution. And that gives us about 14 micron uh, per pixel resolution. So, so this is really quite high resolution. We can film and identify objects down to about 30 microns in size with this, with this setup. And so this is, uh, this is a video of what we saw. So this is about four and a half seconds of um, high-speed video, which has been slowed down. And you can see a variety of um, snowflakes, which are impacting this uh, interface between the, the air up here and the, the seawater down here. And you can see that some of these uh, particles are in focus. Some of, quite a few of them are not. And a lot of them have different sizes. Some, some are quite large and, and many of them are quite small. Some penetrate several centimeters or some just sort of stick near the surface. And so you see these, these small uh, dots. And so um, that's what I wanna focus on uh, more. So these are, these are the bubbles that are forming. And <clears throat> just to give you an idea of what size snowflakes we're talking about, um, these snowflakes were in the range of about half a millimeter up to about seven millimeters in size and impacted that air water interface at anywhere from about half a meter up to about two meters per second. So that, that gives you an idea of sort of what, uh, what size and speed we're talking about. Now I'd like to look at one uh, snowflake in particular that'll be around uh, the five millimeter size hitting uh, the air water interface at about one, uh, one meter per second. So here's, here's a higher magnification view of that snowflake and you can see it um, impacting the air water interface. It has some momentum, so it, uh, it crosses the air water interface, um, uh, even though there's some uh, surface tension resisting it. Um, you can see that as, as soon as it, uh, it hits and crosses that interface, um, the ice, ice crystals completely melt within 200 milliseconds. That leaves behind this little plume of fresh water from the melted snowflake, as well as these bubbles. So you have bubbles that are entrained, and they move downwards in this uh, vortex ring pattern um, until uh, the larger bubbles start to uh, escape. They start to rise more quickly because they're more buoyant, whereas the smaller bubbles are um, entrained deeper into the water because they're less. So you can see that again with the snow crystals melting, releasing these ice bubbles. <clears throat> and um, you can probably see that a little bit better in this video where we've manually tracked um, several of these uh, of these bubbles, you can see them sort of spinning around in this little vortex pattern. And again, they start to rise up after um, you know several hundred milliseconds, um, and they'll presumably rise up to the surface where they would then burst and generate uh, aerosol droplets. <clears throat> um, so, so what about these bubbles? How uh, let's let's zoom in even further and look at how these bubbles form. So, this is looking at a similar video where we've um, we've really looked. At uh, sort of the highest magnification we can, and you can see uh, in more detail this process of the ice crystals uh, melting. These are sort of columnar ice crystals. They're melting, and as, as the individual crystals melt, these little tiny bubbles seem to pop into existence um, from, those, from those ice crystals. And so you can see that happening, um, especially with this bubble uh, right here and several of these bubbles over here. These bubbles just seem to pop into existence as the ice crystals melt. Um, and so that's, that may be a little bit more obvious here. Here's another example. Um, so again, these ice crystals are, are really quite small, um, tens of, of microns perhaps. Um, and you can see uh, quite a few of these little, of these little uh, air bubbles are sort of um, being generated um, as they're released from inside of, the, um, from inside of these um, ice crystals that, that surround these air cavities. Now, how, how many bubbles are being produced by a typical snowflake? So we, we did a few statistics on the approximately 75 uh, snowflakes that we, um, that we were able to capture um, in the sort of preliminary experiments. Um, so again, you see snowflake size on the x-axis here from about one to seven millimeters in size. And you know, for, for very small bubbles, we probably only had a, just a couple of, uh, sorry, for very small snowflakes, we only had a couple of bubbles. But for much larger snowflakes, sort of large, large ones in the five to six millimeter range, we could have 100 uh, or 150 of these, these bubbles. Um, and uh, I should also- Sorry, David, that... you have one minute left. Okay, I, think, uh, I should point out that the, um, the uh, resolution only allowed us to measure bubbles down to about 30 microns in size. There's, there's definitely smaller ones as well. They can, they can penetrate a couple of uh, 
uh, centimeters down into the ocean surface. Um, so this means that if those bugs will form, or when they form, they'll, they'll float back up to the surface quickly and burst. Um, so in summary, um, snow, melt, uh, snow particles melting in sea, whether freshly falling or wind blown, um, generate micro bubbles, which likely burst to generate marine aerosol. Um, this mechanism, which uh, hasn't been, been well studied before, uh, could be impo important um, in the icy polar seas or fetch is limited as a uh, marine aerosol generation mechanism. And obviously, this is just the beginning. This is very preliminary. Um, we're interested in looking at um, the effect of blown snow versus fresh, no uh, fresh snow, actually trying to measure some of those aerosol, aerosol statistics in a controlled environment. And then, as, uh, in addition to the future, try to parameterize uh, snowfall for inclusion in some of these um, aerosol generation and climate models. Um, so that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take questions at the, at the end. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, very interesting work. Uh, I, I'm not too sure how much they contribute, but we'll get to that in the question answer uh, session for the next uh, presentation for now. Uh, the next presentation was supposed to be by Son Truong, but I think Stephen uh, Seams is uh, giving the presentation, but he has sent a video. Mm -hmm. So the SCAR team, can you please play the video for us? SCAR IT team, are you available? Okay, uh, Stephen, uh, just in case they do not get back to us within the next 10, 15 seconds, uh, I might have to ask you to, to give the presentation live, if that's okay. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Uh, SCAR team, are you there? I am contacting. I am contacting. Okay. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, Stephen, if you don't mind, uh, just let's let's do it live. We have a couple of extra minutes, either which way. But it would be sure. nice to listen to you live. <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen, and that's up there. And go full presentation. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Perfect. And, that's great. And you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Uh, this will be a little bit different. Um, we are interested in cloud macro physics. We are interested in the structure of clouds their thickness where they appear over the high latitudes of the Southern Ocean. This work was conducted by Sun Trong, who's just submitted for his PhD, he's off to another job. And um, I'm a supervisor along with Yi Huang and Mike Manton. And a image that's probably familiar to a lot of us with the climate world is, is this bias in the radiative forcing over the high latitudes of the Southern Ocean. So this is by Kevin Trenberth and, and Fasulo in 2010, and you can sit there and see when you get down to 60 degrees south, we're getting a bias in there of 25, 30 watts per meter squared, and that's not matched in the northern hemisphere. And the question is, what's unique about the high latitudes of the southern ocean? We'd like to understand where this bias is coming from. And one of the immediate things that came out was that, well, when Calypso came up was the presence of supercooled liquid water over the Southern Ocean. This was the frequency. This was a paper by Hugh in 2010, an early look at Calypso. And you could see this nice band of high frequency of supercooled liquid water from 40, 45 degrees south to the edge of Antarctica, unmatched over the Northern Hemisphere. It's not in the North Atlantic. It's not in the North Pacific. And this is believed to be able to contribute to the radiation bias that we find in the Southern Ocean. Now, um, there's been a lot of work. There continues to be a lot of work on this. There's a lot of modeling efforts. One thing that you'll note though, is that this is all the way across the Southern Ocean, whereas the bias is predominantly at the high latitudes of the Southern Ocean, poleward of the ocean polar front. And there have been a number of studies where they adjust the melting point or the, the conversion point of ice with regards to temperature. And what you can find is that you can improve the bias at the high latitudes, but then introduce a bias at the lower latitudes if you just use temperature as a control. We're interested in looking differently at this. We're interested in the cloud macrophysics. We're trying to see how the Southern Ocean is different than the Northern Hemisphere. And this is also an image that came out of the A-Train satellites. This is by Jay Mace in, 20, in 2009. 
and it's looking at multi-layer cloud structure from it's a merged CloudSat Calypso product, but multi-layer cloud structure for low and mid-level clouds. And what you can see, this image too suggests that the Southern Ocean is vastly different than the Northern Hemisphere, than the North Pacific, than the North Atlantic. But what you also see is that this multi-layer structure is really most prevalent over the high latitudes where we get the radiation bias. We wanna understand if this bias or this, this multi-layer structure could be contributing to it? And, and are we doing okay with it? Do we have a problem in the models with multi-layer structure? So our question is, do we find a bias in the number of cloud layers represented in the era five reanalysis over the high latitudes of the Southern Ocean? Can any bias contribute to the persistent bias in the radiation budget over the high latitudes? Over the course of 2016 and 2018, there's been a lot of, well, there's been a lot of interest in the past decade in the Southern Ocean for this radiation bias, and it has driven field work. And from 26 to eight, 2016 to 2018, there was a collection of four field campaigns coordinated. There was Capricorn, Marcus, Socrates, and Miker. These were funded by the US Na National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, in the Australian Maritime National Facility. And Greg Mafarquhar has a nice article in the Bulletin of the American Met Society in 2021, talking about many aspects of this field work. In all, there were 2,186 atmospheric soundings launched over this 28 month period. The ones for MICER were off of Macquarie Island, they would have been launched anyway, but there was still then an additional nine or 800 soundings launched from ships and aircraft predominantly in the summer of 2018, January, February, March, 2018. We wanna use those soundings to discover something about the multi-layer structure and then see what's going on in the reanalysis. We haven't had these kind of observations over the Southern Ocean before especially at remote locations. We have observations at Macquarie Island, we have observations at the coast, but between 55 and 60, 65 south, we have virtually no soundings, none on a regular basis. So what you can see here is a cross section from the ship, the RV investigator. It had a radar and LIDAR product, somewhat similar to the satellites, only you're at the surface and they have a merged radar LIDAR cloud product. This is for a 24 hour period, the 16th of February, 2018. And the ship is at fairly high latitudes. I believe it's about 57, 58 north, um, south, sorry, we're in the Southern hemisphere. And, and you can sit there and see for the first nine hours the, of this time period, there was some thick clouds. Then we go into six hours of multi-layer clouds and then we run into a, a low pressure system. And we're very interested in this cloud structure through here. We have the soundings there. And, and just to so you know, ERA-5 actually is forecast model product. It's not assimilated model product. It assimilates the thermodynamic profile. It assimilates the temperature, the dew point temperature, the winds, but then it goes forward and it runs its cloud model. And this is what you would see for that day for the cloud model where the ship was. And it looks nothing like what we observe out there. We're not terribly surprised the ship, uh, the the ERA-5 product is forecast, it's not assimilated. So we wanna use something else. We will be using the dew, point to, the dew point depression because then it's a direct comparison. But before we get there, first off, we took the 2,186 soundings and we sorted them by the synoptic meteorology. We used a K-means cluster. This was published in 2020. Um, and it's a nice little article where we have seven different clusters. And what you would find is that we see some very unique thermodynamics at the C1 cluster, poleward of the polar ocean front, where we get the radiation bias. This is very different than the postfrontal cluster. You would get a warm cluster, we get four clusters across the storm track for the synoptic meteorology. And then we get two clusters at the high latitudes, and we see that this one at C1 is very different than the postfrontal one. Many of the earlier works thought that it was the postfrontal air masses that were causing the bias. 
but we see that C1 is where they're geographically located. Here's a little schematic showing a storm track with some mid-latitude cyclones and where these seven different clusters are. But we want to focus on M3 and C1. And so this cluster is M3. This is our post-frontal air mass. And it's along the storm track. And you can see it's very dry aloft, relatively speaking. The dew point temperature drops off considerably. And as you might expect, it's to the north and west of the cyclone center. Whereas at the high latitudes, it's moist all the way through up to 550 hectopascal. A lot of clouds. And these ones are generally to the south of the cyclone center. So we can't use the Era 5 cloud product. We use the dew point depression as a proxy. This is an old trick used. If you say the dew point temperature is within 1.5 degrees of the temperature, then you're close to saturation. And you say, well, presumably we're close to a cloud layer there. But we can con compare apples to apples here because Era 5 has temperature and dew point temperature. And our physical soundings, which were assimilated into Era 5, have these same observations. So we look at the soundings at a fine resolution. We look at the soundings at the same resolution of ERA-5. And then we look at ERA-5 at the 37 levels. Here's an example of a sounding. ERA-5 looks very, very good. It should. It assimilated the sounding. Those soundings went into making ERA-5. We would expect it to do very well. So how are we doing with counting these dew point depressions, these, these proxies for cloud layers? You can sit there and see that if we just worry about resolution, if we go from a fine resolution where you can see more thin layers to a coarse resolution, we lose some sounding or we lose some cloud layers. This diagonal is a match. This is one, none, one, two, three, or solid cloud layers. And this is what you get when you use the fine soundings or the coarse soundings and just a little scattered diagram. And if you're on this main diagonal, it means they match. If we compare era five, the same soundings with the coarse soundings that were physically observed, you see we lose a lot of cloud layers. ERA-5 is smoothing out a lot of these thin cloud layers or the thermodynamics behind a lot of these thin cloud layers and not allowing us to represent the thin clouds over the high latitudes of the Southern Ocean. The, the algorithm for ERA-5 is, is more important than the vertical resolution. Does this affect the radiation? Yes, we know that. This has been known for a long time. These little cloud layers can have a dramatic effect on the radiative transfer. We can sit there and see an example here for the sounding for the cluster C1, where if you looked at it at fine resolution and you get some cloud layers through there, coarse resolution, we lose some of those sound the, some of those cloud layers. And then we look at era five, in this example here, we pick two, probably not the best, but we see a 50 watt per meter squared between phi and era five. If we did it for cluster C1, well, that can be very dramatic. If you lose a high cloud layer, that will have a very dramatic impact on the radiation budget. In our example here, it was over 100 watt per meter squared difference. So those are, that's the talk. The conclusion that era five the cloud field is relatively coarse over the Southern Ocean. This is not particularly surprising as it's a model product. But if we use dew point depression as a proxy, we still find a large bias. Even though ERA-5 assimilated this, the algorithm smooths out the thermodynamics, which it prevents us from developing these thin cloud layers into the future when we simulate the cloud. And we know that these thin layers can have a dramatic impact or a strong impact on the radiation budget. And this work is published. It just came out in April this year in the International Journal of Climatology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, that's some really exciting work you have going on, which hopefully will solve, which is uh, a, a very common problem in most models. Uh, so I have a few questions on this, but we'll we'll do that later during the question and answer sh session. For our last talk of this block, uh, can I please ask Erhan Arslan to to come online and present? I see that he was he is still here, right? Erhan, can you please uh, share your screen and start your talk?
Erhan, can you hear us? We cannot hear you right now, so uh, you'll have to unmute your mic. Aaron, can you hear us? Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now I, I can hear you. Yeah, please uh, share your screen and and start your your talk. Uh, actually, our presentation will be by by another uh, friend. The name is Göksu uh, Ustular. The presentation okay. uh, will be uh, by Göksu. Uh, Göksu. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, get them to the panel. Yes, I have invited you to join uh, the panel uh, as a panelist. Can you please? Come in, and then you can share your screen. Guxu, uh, can you hear me? Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Sorry sure for thing. the inconvenience. No problem, no problem. Go for it. OK, thank you again for this nice uh, organization. Uh, I will be talking uh, on the behalf of my colleagues today and to present our uh, preliminary works on the western part of the Antarctica uh, for the solar radiation prediction using mostly the, the machine learning models. And here is the our outline that I will mostly follow during the presentation. And firstly, I will try to give the state of the art for the prediction that you will all probably better know. And I will introduce our models, uh, which are based on the machine learning algorithms, and also will give some preliminary results from our ongoing projects, which is probably extend to the following three years, and also the future works uh, that we have planned. And of course, it's it might be a strange as a geologist to explain the solar radiation to the atmospheric science community, but I just like to express the, its importance, both for the climate change and the, also the energy management, especially for the remote areas like Antarctica, for instance, which is greatly important to monitor and also the, the, the predictions is getting important due to the high cost uh, management for the for the on-site measurements, as you probably know or notice, and therefore uh, the in the literature there is a really incremental effort for the prediction models uh, that can be, for instance, uh, combined in three main titles like the structural models, which are mostly based on the meteorological and uh, geographical parameters that we have present today, and also there are some time series models which are mostly based on the historical data. This is endogenous forecasting, for instance, as a name. And for the hybrid models, as the name implies, that combines all data, including some additional variables like the air pollution data, for instance. And of course, to implement such models, uh, there is a wide various, uh, there are various kinds of uh, algorithms or statistical models exist in the literature. And the machine learning models or algorithms uh, have been incrementally increasing in the literature, as you notice from in the last two decades, the, there is a really increase in the number of publications on this uh, manner, uh, including the different kinds of machine learning models from generalized to ensemble or class, classification based models are widely used uh, in, in the solar radiation predictions. And therefore, in, in our ongoing project, uh, we are try to find the, the, the so-called best, uh, the machine learning algorithms, mostly specifically to the, the Western Antarctic conditions. And we have now only one meteorological station in our research camp area, but uh, we are trying to increase our collaboration uh, with the surrounding stations to increase our uh, data set in terms of both spatial, spatial and also temporal resolution. And also we will combine some empirical models exist in the, in the literature that have been also gaining importance uh, from changing from first order to second order differential equations, for instance, 
and we will use our predicted data for those uh, models as well in the future works. And uh, yeah, here is the our study area that we our country has a temporary scientific research camp here in the Orsi Island in the Antarctic Peninsula. And we, we got some weathering data almost from two years period that we will present today. And the, the, the measuring parameters are the straightforward ones from sunshine duration to the, to the solar radiation within a specific calendar time. And here is the, some descriptive statistics for each parameters. And if we go into the, for instance, temperature and radiation, so as expected in the Antarctic summer, for instance, and uh, there is a good correlation in the temperature and radiation that have re relatively higher values in, in these periods. And as a methodology that we applied uh, for today talk, and we got uh, the minute data to and convert them to the hourly and as a specific words. And also we applied numerous pre-processing uh, procedures, which are very essential for such works, as you know. And we, we applied some filtering and we extract the non-existent values. And also we applied some scaling, which is again, important process for the, for the imbalance data, as you probably noticed from the descriptive statistics. And then we have applied few uh, algorithms, but we will increase the number of these um, models as well, the algorithms, even if we have chance to increase our temporal resolution uh, we are planning to apply the deep learning as well to, to just compare the machine learning ones. And at the end, uh, we have different kinds of evaluation methods, actually. Uh, for now, we have only used the, the testing data remain from the whole, whole data set. But in future, uh, we are willing to uh, find some additional new data set to uh, check or to control our models uh, if the prediction values are correct or not. And at the end, of course, we will so-called pr provide some pr prediction algorithms that have best uh, models for these purposes. And before the machine learning models, I just like to uh, show the, the correlation map uh, for the variables that we have used. And as you see, there is a really small or low correlation between the temperature and the sun, sunshine duration with the radiation that we, that is our target. And therefore we might say that there is not much linear correlation between those. And therefore the machine learning algorithms that can be or can provide some insight actually in these kind of uh, correlations here. And also uh, the feature selection is an important stage as you know, and for the, for the machine learning algorithms and to select the importance of the variables. And we use the random forest algorithm uh, for, for these purposes, but there are many, many other uh, algorithms that can be performed as well. And as you notice here, and most of the variables have an, a, a comparable fact, a comparable importance for our training models. And therefore, we use all these variables to train the, the machine learning models. And for the preliminary results, and this is the evaluation results of our training model, we use different statistical metrics from R squared to the negative mean absolute error, for instance. And the XG was the extreme gradient posting algorithm, and the random forest uh, will give the best results or in other words, maybe the more accurate ones in terms of the statistics. And also uh, we did some voiding, which is the ensemble model. The, it's a combination of the XG bus and random forest. It, this is also enhanced, uh, comparably enhanced uh, our training models as well. But for the rest, we have an incremental decrease in the, in the uh, accuracy among the algorithms through the support vector regression from key nearest near world to the support vector, uh, support vector regression. So here is the prediction results for, for you and uh, to just, and also as expected from the training models and the, the R squares are also comparable. Again, the voiding is the best one together with the random forest and XG bust. And the rest is, is are mostly comparable. We also need some additional turning parameters while predicting. Therefore, there might be some small increase, in, for instance, in the 
support vector regression or model. So yeah, as you notice from here, the decision-based uh, algorithms give the better results compared to other ones, like the random forest and XGBus, for instance. And the, it's their combination, actually, the voiding or stacking you can do as well in the ensemble models uh, are really given best, better uh, accuracy as also stated in the literature. And for the rest, for especially for the KNN and this, the uh, support vector machine uh, have comparable less accuracy, probably due to the, their clustering based algorithm in its uh, in its maths in, in, in their algorithms. So as a feature works, uh, as I said, yeah, we need to still uh, improve our models by comparing or by, by just tuning the parameters and add, add some additional uh, algorithms again. And we will try to use this predict data to handle the empirical models as well in our feature works. And also we will test the, the models with the new data set from the field and uh, whether it includes the solar radiation or not, uh, we will try to use this data to predict, to produce the new data sets. And also in, in our future works, in our ongoing work, uh, we, will, we are willing to enhance the temperatures and also uh, temporal and also the special resolution for the measured data set for a better understanding of the prediction models for the area. So thank you for your attendance and we are happy to any contribution. Hey, thanks a lot, Goksu. Uh, that was You're very welcome. interesting to see that uh, machine learning here, learning has reached uh, the radiation field also. This is going yeah. to be good to see uh, how, how much of an improvement that can lead to. Uh, okay, with thank that, you. we are in our question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please raise your hands or feel free to ask uh, any questions. Uh, I see that there are no open questions in the in the question answer chat box. Uh, you feel free to write your questions over there also. Uh, I see that there are some questions now coming up. Um, this is for the cloud. So I assume this is going to be Stephen asked, uh, answering this. Uh, for the presence of supercooled water clouds, was the temperature of air masses likely to be less than 10 degrees centigrade or less within the cloud layers uh, at altitudes, which were con considered uh, as criteria for identification of these supercooled clouds? OK, so we haven't looked specifically at when we have multi-layer cloud versus supercooled liquid water, but when you're at the higher latitudes, generally most of your cloud layers are going to be colder than minus 10. Um, it's only at the lower latitudes where you can get the supercooled liquid water at warmer temperatures where you're getting kind of the Bergeron fin Dyson, or I'm sorry, you're getting Mount Hallett moss up going on. Hello? Sorry. I hope uh, that answered the Yes. Uh, uh, so hopefully that's answered your question, uh, Neha. Uh, after that, uh, Mark, I see that you raised your hand first, was it? Or was it Takashi? I don't know, but you can go it ahead. Was, it was Takashi. Okay, Takashi, please uh, go ahead with your question. Okay, so first of all, uh, just a continuation for the question to the crowd. So Steve Stevens seems, uh, how about for these... Uh, Multi-layer cloud satellite observation only look from the top, and ground observation mainly look from the bottom. And how is those uh, uh, climatology from satellite observation also has some bias, or how do you think about those points? Um, uncertainly, there's going to be all satellite products aren't perfect. So the, the satellite product by Jay Mace was a merged radar LIDAR product using cloud uh, satin for, Calypso. Hmm, that means uh, for uh, virtual sounding satellites. For the enough. soundings? But how about, hmm, how about the uh, image or just a... Uh, what do you say? Uh, passive measurement is slightly uh, biased. Yes, um, I mean, I mean, there's a, a big body of work looking at the biases in passive instruments mm -hmm. like MODIS when mm -hmm. they try to represent 
multi-layer structures. Mm -hmm. We know that passive instruments, mm -hmm. you know, going all the way back to ISKIP would sit mm -hmm. there and just give you a cloud somewhere in between the two and yeah. um, something not very realistic. I mean, that's that's very observant point you have there. Mm -hmm. And now, as you said, you can use uh, particle sounding satellite, and that is not so much difficult to observe the real, uh, real cloud distribution. Um, I mean, I, I, all of these products out there, you, even the active sensors are going to have some biases with them. Um, but I mean, what we are interested in is what winds up in the reanalyses, because this is where we see the biases in era mm -hmm. five, you know, what we think is the truth, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the paper by Trendberth showed us that our reanalysis is biased out over these latitudes, yeah. which is disappointing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mark, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you. So this, this sort of follows on from the question and answer just then um, and Steve's talk, but it uh, it's for, um, sorry if I don't get the pronunciation right, Goksu for the machine learning work. Yeah, um, so thank you for the presentation. That was really interesting. Um, so I've, uh, I've also been looking at uh, trying to predict solar radiation with machine learning in East Antarctica. I've been using about 25 years of data from the ships from the Australian uh, platforms. Um, and I've been doing some comparisons with ERA-5 as well. So obviously ERA-5 has got these large radiation biases, particularly at the high latitudes of about on the order of 60, 70 watts per square meter. But when I compare the, the, the R squared value, it's only about, about 0.7 in East Antarctica. And when I apply my machine learning algorithms and get them the best they can, including cloud information, I only get up to about 0.75 for the R squared value. Now the um, the values that you showed for your R squared were very high. They were sort of 0.9 or 0.85, which is really impressive. Um, so I'm I'm wondering what could be the difference there. But my question is actually uh, how you did your training and testing split, and whether you did cross validation, and if your testing sets were whole years separated from your training or if they're split randomly yeah we, we split the randomly the, the testing value around 80 percentages for training for instance and remain for the testing mm -hmm. and we, we we have used the 10 tenfold uh cross validation and mm -hmm. also specific training parameters for each uh, algorithm as you better know and we just tune the parameters for XGBOST and the, the random forest again as well. And uh, yeah, I don't know the issue or the, and the additional issue for that. And we, I can I can also share the scripts or the other things, we, or we can uh, let her talk on the on the uh, accuracy as well. So my my uh, yeah, my worry is that if you've got a a, a train data a, a train point and then a test mm -hmm. point and then a train point right next to it within sort of three hours that you're, you, you've got some temporal, you might have some temporal leak, leakage there. Oh yeah. Um, no, no. So I think it could be interesting to withhold mm -hmm. one whole year of data um, yeah. from your training and test on that and see how well it performs then. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, could be that could be really interesting. Exactly, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, can, we can, we can, to check yeah. this like this by splitting the as you as you suggested uh yeah. Yeah, yeah i can i can inform you with the with the outcomes thank you for the contribution i would love to discuss this more but i'll let other okay. people ask questions it's really exciting yeah, yeah. thank you okay okay thank you thanks mark uh damien i see you have your hand up do you want to ask your question i do um i have a question for for david um uh Fascinating um, talk and, and interesting. Like, like the, the videos that you showed are really are really interesting. Um, I'm kind of wondering. So the the bubbles that are entrained, or um, that's probably not the right word. The bubbles that are contained within the snowflakes. Um, is it your expectation that they would contain pure air, or is it your expectation that they would contain um, aerosols plus air? And uh, and if and if it's the latter. Um, do you think that the, um, the 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 mixture of the um, 
of the aerosol on the air would affect the the sort of nature of the of the formation of the bubble within the snowflake. Are you able to speak a little bit to um to the to the nature of the bubbles you know within the snowflakes? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. I hadn't I hadn't considered the the possibility that um, there might be aerosols within those tiny uh, within those tiny air cavities. Um, I suspect it's it's largely air um, and. Um, I mean, when the snowflake forms in the atmosphere, um, those, hmm, I suppose it's possible, but I, I hadn't really considered the, the possibility that there might be um, aerosols within that cavity. My, my guess is, is it's, it's probably not a large component. Um, I think um, aerosol formation would, would occur from, the, uh, from those bubbles bursting. And uh, since they're so small, jet drops or jet droplets would be the, the main um, uh, the main type of aerosol precursor from uh, formed from those bubble bursting uh, from, from bubble bursting. Takashi, you mm -hmm. have your Thank hand you. up. Thank you. I see Neha has her hand up. Neha, do you have a question to ask? Yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question with Dr. Steve. Okay. Yeah. I was eagerly waiting for your presentation. The similar kind of work I presented uh, in yesterday's session on polar meteorology. Um, and uh, my question is, in Trump 2020 paper, the classification criteria which was adopted was based on teams clustering. So how appropriate it will be if we consider the classification based on Southern Ocean fronts? Um, so our clustering, our... our, our clustering we did was k-means clustering uh we used yeah. the basic variables at low levels from the sounding so we used the winds the temperature the humidity at like 925 850 and 700 or, or i'm sorry it was up there it's 925 i believe 800 and 700 hectopascal and the surface values i'm not i'm sorry i don't know if i answered your question what, what's your question i'm sorry yeah, uh, uh, what I'm trying to ask is like whether uh, for the classification criteria in that paper they have adopted uh, k means clustering method for warm, uh, warm, moderate, and cold regions. But however, if we consider the classification based on submission fronts, like uh, subtropical fronts, sub um, I the audio was dropping in and out there, so I apologize. I, I had a hard time following the question um was the question on the sensitivity of the clustering no i think uh, her was, question, was, uh, question is... neha was trying to ask was what if you use the fronts to cluster your soundings ah, the than... fronts yes w rather than using the soundings using the fronts to cluster it yeah um well the storm track probably works reasonably well either way we were quite impressed with how the storm track came out so clearly with the k-means clustering I mean, we were kind of forced to take the observations we had, the sounding observations we had. Um, we did take a look at where it was with regards to the the mid latitude low, um, or the, you know, the the storm track. Um, at higher latitudes, it's a bit of a mess. If you, if you've looked at the fronts across the higher latitudes, even meso cyclones, they're they're a bit of a disaster. But when we looked at it in more detail, we found out that most of the most of the differences were relatively small. So, um, and, and the k-means cl uh, clustering has worked fairly well. So, uh, it's it's yeah. a it's a pretty good way of of, of uh, separating them out, right? Yep. Yep. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have no more time, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for uh, today as well for this session. So, uh, we are going to continue with the next set of talks, and Damien will be taking us uh, through those. Uh, Damien, uh, up to you now. Um, yeah, thank you, Anup. Thank you uh, for um, doing an excellent job of chairing the first block. I have um, some difficulty thinking that I'll be able to do as good a job, but I'll do my best. Um, so uh, just a reminder, um, the talks um, run for uh, 10 minutes and then we're allowing two minutes for the changeover. Um, I think that judging by the... Um, the participants, it looks like all of the people that are presenting are present. So hopefully we don't have any absent talks. 
Um, so that's um, that's good to know. Um, it means you'll have to stick to time though. Um, uh, a reminder that these uh, this session is being recorded, um, even though it's um, in the program as two separate blocks, the two blocks are kind of being combined into one. Um, so um, uh, so the, the recordings will all uh, will, will just continue. Um, and a reminder to the um, to the people attending, if you want to ask a question, you may find that the that the chat um, doesn't work, but you can send questions in via the Q and A. Uh, we um, will then ask those questions, and we can uh, we can bring you in uh, and allow you to. Um, uh, or, well, we can bring you in to uh, ask those questions yourself, uh, or we can uh, read them off the chat. Um, off the sorry, off the Q and A. So um, I think uh, I'm not sure if uh, any of the other um, uh, conveners have anything to say um, before we start. No, I think we're okay to go. So um, good, excellent. Um, the first talk um, uh, is by Noe Pere, uh, sorry, Pele, um, on the uh, atmospheric hydrological cycle. Um, so um, Noe, if you could. Uh, uh, um, share your screen and unmute. Um, we're I'm ready to hear your talk. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll give you a warning with two minutes to go. Uh, okay. So uh, I will share my screen. Can you see my screen well? All good, thank you. Okay, super. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, my name is uh, Noé Pierlet from uh, UC Louvain in Belgium. Um, and uh, thanks for coming to this presentation about uh, the main results of my master thesis um, about the atmospheric hydrological cycle in Antarctica uh, in past and future. So um, let's begin with a brief introduction and, um, and let's start. Uh, no, so uh, first of all, I would like to tell you about uh, a physical law, uh, the closest Clapeyron's law. So um, this law uh, tells us that uh, as the temperature increases, the saturation uh, vapor pressure also increases. Uh, so in other words, um, the capacity of the air to hold water vapor uh, increases. Um, and as I'm sure you know, uh, and as this animation shows, um, there, is, there, there has been an increase in the temperature, the global mean temperature for the several decades. And uh, this uh, temperature increase combined with the closest Clapeyron's law uh, leads to an intensification of the global hydrological cycle. So, um, also, if, if you look at this animation and more precisely over the Antarctic region, um, uh, we see a smaller temperature increase in this region. And moreover, a change in the hydrological cycle in Antarctica uh, would imply a number of changes uh, that would in turn modify the, the climate, such as a change in the surface mass balance, uh, of the Antarctic ice sheets or uh, the changes in albedo or even uh, in the ocean surface uh, density and temperature. And uh, so the question uh, then arises, uh, what about the variability of the hydrological cycle in Antarctica? And uh, in my master thesis, um, I, uh, I focus, uh, I'm focused uh, about uh, the atmospheric part of this hydrological cycle in Antarctica. So um, I addressed the, follow, the three following question. Um, one about the seasonal uh, cycle, uh, the seasonal cycle of this uh, cycle, and uh, one about the past four decades of variability of this cycle, and one about the, the projection uh, for the future of this cycle. So uh, just before moving on to the, 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 the the results, um, I would like to present you the processes involved in the atmospheric hydrological cycle and the data that I use to represent them. 
So here I included the equation of the atmospheric water balance. Um, and this equation can be understood as the variability of the precipitable water uh, through time uh, as equal to the combination of three processes, the precipitation, the evaporation, and the uh, moisture convergence. And to visualize this equation, um, uh, let's consider a column of air that extends from the surface to the top of the atmosphere, in which the water can enter through the through the evaporation process. So then the uh, water vapor can be transported from one column to another, which is characterized by the moisture convergence or divergence. And uh, to close the loop, the water vapor can uh, leave the column through the precipitation process. So um, to represent these three processes, um, I use data. And for the seasonal and the multi-year study, so the two first question, I use the era five reanalysis data. And for the projection, so the last question, I use the access model data with the SSP uh, 585 scenario. So now uh, let's turn on to the results and let's begin with the seasonal study. So um, here on this figure, you have the time series uh, for each process involving the atmospheric hydrological cycle. So uh, in orange, the precipitation, red moisture convergence, and in blue, the evaporation. And uh, the, this curve are for the Antarctic as a whole. And the main feature of the cycle is the intensification during the autumn. And we also see a little bounce here for the moisture convergence. And we, we, we ask uh, the, the, the following question, uh, where uh, does this uh, bounce come from? So to answer this question, we decided to divide um, the studied region into five sectors uh, like this. And uh, we look the time series for each process for each sector uh, individually. And what we see is that for the ABS sector, for ABS is for Admission and Bellingshaus and Seas uh, sector, we have uh, a, 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 a signal like a, a, a bounce. And this bounce come from uh, mainly from the ABS sector with this bounce in the moisture convergence. And also we have a bounce for the precipitation. So the question now is, um, what are the mechanisms behind uh, this bounce? And to answer this question, we use seasonal maps. And uh, so in this presentation, I will uh, only show uh, the autumn map. Um, and here you have the moisture convergence map. So to understand the spatiotemporal variability of the moisture convergence, um, we, we use uh, dynamics and um, here you have the pressure uh, map, the sea level pressure map for the autumn. And what we see is that we have three main low pressure region, uh, which are around the air wrap uh, clockwise um, and uh, then meets the steep slopes of the ice sheets and creates these three main uh, convergence uh, zones. And so we understand that uh, the, 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 the sea level pressure variability can explain the um, variability of the atmospheric circulation and then the moisture convergence. And so we use the semi-annual oscillation called SAO, uh, which is the strengthening and the weakening of the sea level pressure uh, twice a year uh, around the Antarctica um, to explain the, the bounds that we have seen uh, previously uh, for the moisture convergence and uh, for the precipitation. So, here is the map for the precipitation. And what we have is nearly the same uh, as for the moisture convergence. And it's because once the air is blocked it, by the steep slopes of the Antarctica, uh, it must uh, goes up and it undergoes um, an orographic lifting and then condensation and then precipitation. So now let's look a bit about the multi-year study. So, we know that we have uh, we had uh, uh, an intensification of the hydrological cycle, um, and so we are interested to see 
which um, uh, which process uh, contribute to, to this uh, intensification. And what we see here is that for the past four decades, evaporation doesn't have any trends, uh, any significant trends, while for precipitation and moisture convergence, we have a positive trends. So the, the, the new question now is um, what can explain these positive trends uh, for the moisture convergence and for precipitation? And the, to, to answer this question, we use uh, trends map, trends map here for the moisture convergence. And uh, uh, what we use is the is uh, another time the dynamics to uh, to answer uh, the, the, the to, to explain this pattern. And uh, we use, yeah. Um, and uh, what we see is that the the the, the trends of the sea level pressure um, induce an intensification of the moisture convergence in this region and this region and a decrease in this region. And we are all also uh, we, we also think that the uh, southern annular mode SAM, um, which, which is increases uh, during the, the past decades, uh, the, the SAM index increase during the past decades, uh, contributes uh, to explain this pattern. And finally, for the projection, um, uh, we use the difference between uh, the end of the century and the beginning of the century. Um, and what we see on this figure, that is the, the, the time series of the difference, and there is only positive difference means, uh, and that means uh, we, have, we will have an intensification of the hydrological cycle. Uh, this is mainly, uh, uh, which occur mainly during the winter for the evaporation. This is due to the large decrease of the sea ice, uh, the sea ice. Um, during winter, and we have a, a, an increase about 10.5%. And for the moisture convergence and the precipitation, the, the increase occur mainly during the autumn. And this is due to the strengthening of the atmospheric circulation. Um, and for the moisture convergence, it's about 22.1%. And for the precipitation, the increase is about 18.5%. Uh, so, to conclude this presentation rapidly, um, there is the thermodynamic and dynamic factors uh, explain the variability of uh, the cycle. We observe an intensification of the cycle over the last four decades, um, and this is largely due to the convergence of the moisture and precipita precipitation changes. And uh, finally, the access uh, model uh, project an intensification of the uh, Antarctic atmospheric hydrological cycle by the end of this century um, as a result of changes in temperature, sea ice concentration, and atmospheric circulation. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Noe. That's a, a very interesting. Um, um, look forward to the discussion we'll have in a few talks' time. Um, so, the next talk is um, um, being presented by uh, Suresh Kumar Baredi. Um, Suresh, if you are here, yes, I can see you. Um, so if you could uh, unmute, very good, and uh, and share your screen. Um, and uh, so if you could make it full screen, uh, that would be better. So it's not full screen yet. Um, yeah. Okay. Is it now uh, showing you full screen? No, not yet, not on my screen. Um, I'm having full screen here. Ah, um, have you, are you sharing the correct screen? Are you sharing the screen that has the full screen version on it? Perhaps. Um, now it is fine, right? Um, um, so on my screen, it's not full screen. I can still see your PowerPoint. I will stop um, share and I will screen. Uh, yeah, maybe unshare and then share again.
So I'm still not still not seeing a full screen, but um, perhaps it doesn't really matter. So uh, I think maybe we should just proceed. Um, you can um, just scroll through the slides. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Suresh, and I'll give you a warning at eight minutes. Yeah. So sorry for the disturbance. Uh, I don't know whether you are seeing my full screen or not. See, today in this talk, I am. I will be talking about the summertime high abundance of succinic, succinic citric and glycolic acid in Antarctic aerosols. As you know that this Antarctic is having a pristine environment. Since it is far away from the anthropogenic emissions, it is very uh, crucial. It, it is very you know, it, it atmosphere is provide the to study the sources and formation of organic aerosols in the pristine environment. So in this study, I'll be slightly discussing about the sources and formation of organic aerosols. Am I audible? Hello? Hello? Excuse me? We can we can hear. Yep, yeah. we can hear you. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. So see, my sampling site is, you know, uh, are the station in East Antarctica. As you can see in this figure, As you can see in this figure, uh, you can see in this figure, the Bharati station was surrounded by the so many ice-free regions. This, this is the classical picture I have taken from the Australian Antarctic magazine to see the surroundings of the Bharati station. See this brown color, uh, this, you may have seen this brown color regions are uh, indicates about the ice-free regions, whereas the blue color indicates the lake and uh, this Bharati station is existed at the uh, coast, uh, existed at the coastal coastal of the Southern Ocean. You can see, you can see here, as a part of uh, uh, as a part of 36 Indian scientific expedition to Antarctica, the PM10 aerosol samples have been collected by using a high volume A8 sounder at the Bharati stations during the period December to January 2016 and 17. So, in order to see the in order to, to see the what is the sources and the formation processes and the transformation of organic aerosols in the Antarctic environment. So these PM10 samples will be analyzed by using the, by using a GC gas chromatography technique to analyze the homologous series of dicarboxylic acids, oxo acids, and alpha dicarbonates as, as well as the cit citric and pyruvic acids by employing a water extraction. You can see here during this period we we notice a two different kinds of air masses. So we categorize those air masses into a high altitude tropos uh, high altitude troposphere air masses and low altitude troposphere air masses. You can see here in the right-hand side figure. So during the first period, that is high altitude air masses, air masses are originated from the very high altitudes, so more than about 2,000 uh, meters, 2,000 meters, then, uh, then arrived towards the sampling side. Whereas in the other- Sorry, right, Suresh, can I just interrupt? Um, I, I'm still on the first slide. Is um, can, any, can one of the other panelists say whether their slides are advancing? Yeah, yeah. No, you can see here. Now I'm showing the result directly. I'm coming to the result. Here I showed the, all the chemical composition. This is molecular distribution of all the organic acids. You can see here, this is the oxalic acid. And we found the high abundance of succinic acid as well as the citric acid, as well as the glyoxalic acid. You can see here. So this high abundance of this succinic and citric acid is completely different from the distrib molecular distributions compared to the continental urban aerosols as well as the remote marine aerosols. So this typical molecular distribution indicates the importance of biogenic emissions over the, uh, over the coastal Antarctic. As you can see here, you, here one more point is you can also see here these uh, red red bars and blue bars. Red blue bar indicates the uh, high altitude air masses, whereas red bar indicates the low altitude air masses. So we also sorry, I've just got to inter interrupt. I can only see the map from your first slide at the moment. I cannot see the bars that you're talking about, which I suspect might be the third slide. Is that so is that the same for you, Damien? That looks better. Oh, now, which slide you are seeing? Can yep, I, I can see it now. You cannot see anything. Uh, so uh, previously we could not see your second slide, but we can now see your third slide. So, um, uh, so if you can um, just proceed with your third slide, um, but I think you need to um, uh, advance the slides in in some way. Uh, so, if you go um, to slide number three. Um, I think that's where you're up to. Is that correct? This is slide number two. Is it right? Uh, yes. at, at present, I can see slide number one. Only slide number one. This is showing only Indian map. This is an Antarctic map. Yeah. Or like how 
how now, now you are able to see slide this is slide number 1 for so yes. number 1 slide number 2 yes yeah. okay I will continue yep. like so, this because you know, so I, I just re recommend changing the slides by using your mouse on the panel on the left hand side rather than your keyboard because I think that's not working for us. So, no. um, so if you click on the slide on the left hand side, that will change it, I think. Left hand side. The, um, the selection of slides on your PowerPoint um, presentation. Um, so now is it, can I continue now like this otherwise? Yeah, look, um, um, when you, yeah, I can see your third slide now. So uh, yeah. um, if they don't progress, I'll let you know. Because it so has you can just continue. Yeah, now you can see here. This is the third, this is the, now I hope we are seeing the molecular distribution flag, right? That's this correct. Yeah. Uh, molecular distribution, you can see the, we measured, uh, now, homologous risk of uh, uh, various kinds of dicarboxylic acid, oxo acid, oxo acids, and uh, alpha dicarbonyls, as well as the pyruvic and citric acids in the PM10 samples collected at the Bharati stations, which is located in the East Antarctic, coastal East Antarctic. You can see here this high abundance of uh, uh, succinic acid, high abundance of C4, as well as the high abundance of omega, uh, omega C2, that is glyoxalic acid, as well as the high abundance of citric acid. See, so far, in the if you see in the literature, uh, the, we are we are unaware of the formation of, C, uh, formation of citric acid over the Antarctic. Moreover, this concentration of the citric acid is showing the very higher concentration compared to the continental urban aerosols as well as the remote marine aerosols. That means it indicates the some uh, this citric acid formation is associated with the bio, biogenic emissions, which is which is may which may uh, this, those precursors may form may be on the sea surface micro layer uh, via C2 air emission. It was you now emitting into the atmosphere. This, this is the typical molecular distributions. Usually in continental urban aerosols, we found the high, abor high, high abundant of oxalic acid, but in Antarctic aerosols, we found very low abundance of oxalic acid. This is very typical, uh, this is a very remarkable finding. As well as this high abundance of succinic acid, again, indicates the importance of biogenic emissions over the Antarctic aerosol. Similarly, you can see, uh, you, you can, however, you can see here, there is also a, uh, significant difference in the mass concentration of two air masses. You can see here the blue bar indicates the high altitude air masses, as the red bar indicates the low altitude air masses. There is, there is a significant difference in the mass concentrations between the two air masses, which is clearly noticed in the, during the study period. However, you can see in the, their relative abundances in the, in the uh, dicarboxylic acid, you can see here, there is no significant difference in the, the relative abundances. You can see here, uh, this is the high altitude air masses, dicarboxylic acid showing C4 diacid is 27%, whereas C4 diacid is 28%. The similar other oxo acids and dicarbonyls also, we did not find any significant uh, differences in their abundances. This indicates that the formation, though there is a significant difference in the mass concentrations, but then during their formation, there is no significant difference. And also, this is the remarkable finding from this study. We noticed a high abundance of citric acid over the Antarctica, which is not reported so far. As you know, that citric acid is a semi volatile tricarboxylic acid. It has a very low vapor pressure and high solubility in water. So often, this acid can be used as a proxy for the oxidized organic aerosols in the atmosphere. So far, they reported citric acid in marine aerosols and fog samples, as well as the rainwater samples. However, they didn't report over the Antarctica. This is the first time report ever uh, we uh, noticed in Antarctic aerosols. Still in the literature, there is a significant uh, knowledge gap of their sources and abundances and their impact on cloud formation. And one more important point is he, we, the formation of citric acid, we assign to the biogenic emissions based on the correlations, based on the linear relationship between the, some chemical traces. You can see here citric acid showed the good relation between the C4 diacid as well as the omega C2 diacid, which, indicate, which indicates the uh, citric acid the formation of citric acid may be associated with the biogenic emissions. So, in next slide, so based on these correlations, as well as the you know uh, based on the correlations, based on the correlations between the among the diacids with the chemical tracers. So, we proposed some formation mechanisms 
the sources of oxalic acid as well as sources of citric and uh, pyruvic acid you can see here this is the uh, hypothesization like we hypothesize this possible sources may be responsible for the formation of organic aerosols at bharati station in antarctic so the precursor these are the precursor emissions you can, as you may aware that the unsaturated fatty acids dimethyl uh, dimethyl sulfate and phenolic compounds isoprene as well as the sea spray all these are the all these are the existed on the sea surface uh, that uh, ice surface layer so whenever these air masses you can see here, this color indicates the low altitude air masses whereas this is high altitude air masses whenever these low altitude air masses comes from the you know uh, comes from the uh, this observation site it carries the uh, enough abundant of uh, uh, enough abundant of uh, fine dust particles from the ice free regions and deposited and make deposited on the sea surface area as a result there is a possibility of uh, there is a possibility of uh, biogenic emissions because of this dust contains you know iron and which is you know which because of this iron deposition on the sea surface the phytoplankton boom may be appear so because uh, so during summer time this phyto phytoplankton boom may emit so many biological gases which include the isoprene and phenolic compounds also it can emit and unsaturated fatty also it can emit these are the precursors of the organic compound these precursors may again further oxidize to the some other intermediate compounds such as omega c9 or c9 azelaic acid omega c4 omega c3 as well as malic fumaric and methyl malic acid this glyoxal and methyl glyoxal acids these are the intermediate compound these intermediate compounds cannot stable long time in the atmosphere these compounds then again further oxidize to the sub, further oxidize to the low, low energy dicarboxylic acids such as you can see here in this formation pathway this is omega c2 this is the glyoxalic acid we found here in antarctic areas very high abundance as well as the c4 and citric acid also citric acid may directly we are we, we are assuming that citric acid may be coming from the oxidation of isoprene gases and all these dicarboxylic acid finally will further oxidize to the carb, uh, further oxidize to the c2 acid but however in our study we found very low abundance of oxalic acid so which may be due to the uh, which may be due to the argon metallic interaction so we we hypothesize that the oxalic acid may react with the you know mineral dust particle or iron uh, iron particles in the atmosphere in the presence of uh, aqueous in the presence of aqueous phase atmosphere then it will be converted into the it it will be converted into co2 gas this is the hypothesization what we you know uh, uh, noticed in, in our study period all these results are because this all these uh, bicarboxylic acids are highly water soluble because of its water soluble nature it has a direct implication toward the ccn formation over the uh, antarctic these are the major findings from the study the concentration of c4 and citric acid are several times higher than those continental urban aerosols suggesting the protoxidation of biogenic precursors are important for the secondary organic aerosols in the antarctic succinic acid and other longer chain diacids such as c9 c6 c5 are largely produced from the protoxidation of unsaturated fatty acids via intermediate compounds that are enriched on the sea surface micro layer through the c2 air emission the depletion of c2 and c3 acids can be hypothesized by organometallic interactions in aqueous phase atmosphere which is a, you know, so far you know there is a, there is no other studies very limited very limited studies are available this you know degradation of oxalic acid into the carbon dioxide gas so many studies are required to better understand this you know uh, organometallic interactions in the atmosphere but the high abundance of citric acid in the antarctic aerosols suggests that photosynthesis of marine derived organic precursors associated with the biogenic emissions have largely contributed to the secondary organic aerosols over the antarctic during the summer so these are the implications as i said earlier that's it thank you Thank you very much, Suresh. Sorry about the trouble with your um, slides advancing. Um, so I, I, I let you, uh, I gave you a little bit of extra time. So, um, okay. Um, so the, the next talk, um, we're moving from uh, um, from chemistry very strongly into, into um, physics. Um, it's one of the uh, talks in the Angwin group. So the Antarctic Gravity Wave Instrument Network. Um, it's going to be given by um, Tracy Moffat Griffin. So Suresh, you need to unshare your screen and unmute. And yeah. mute yourself. Yeah. So Tracy, you should now be able to um, share your screen, <laughs> and, and I can hear you. So that's uh, all good. So uh, once again, I'll give you a um, uh, a warning at about um, uh, eight minutes. Thank you. Okay, that's great.
So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm going to be giving a overview talk on the Antarctic Growth Wave Instrument Network. Um, and thank you to all my co-authors who are list listed there. Um, we're from a range of different institutes around the world. So this is very much a sort of a collaborative network. So I'm aware this is a, a mixed audience. Um, so not all of you are aware of what gravity waves are. Um, they're not the gravitational waves, which you may have heard of from a in cosmology, but um, there are buoyancy waves in the atmosphere, essentially, where the restoring force is gravity. And they're quite small scale, and that's a relative term, really. Um, you get atmospheric waves, which are planetary scale. So these waves are have horizontal wavelengths from tens of meet, tens of kilometers up to hundreds of kilometers, and vertical wavelengths of a few kilometers up to about 40, 50 kilometers. So they're quite small scale in the concept in, in reference to the whole atmosphere. But these waves are very, very important for transferring energy momentum through the atmosphere. As they propagate upwards from their various sources, they can break in the atmosphere. And this, this momentum that they break in the atmosphere is driving the atmospheric circulation. So they're very, very important and they're very important to get right in models. You can see the figure at the side here. This is um, wind flow causing mountain waves actually off um, some islands off in, in the South Sandwich Islands down in the, the Southern Ocean. So I said they've got a lot of different sources. So what causes essentially turbulence of different sorts? So we have thunderstorms, we have wind flow over mountains, with things like wind shear, geostrophic adjustment. The polar vortex itself is, is a very good strong source of, of these waves. And things like convection as well, which you see more often in the, in the tropical latitudes. And frontogenesis, you get storm fronts coming through and the activity there is setting up these waves. So you get them propagating up from the lower atmosphere, going all the way up. So why do we actually care about them? Other than we've said they're important for driving atmospheric circulation. Well, over Antarctica, there is this hot spot of activity that's been seen in satellite observations for a while. Um, you can see it here in the, in the bottom of the figure here, which is adapted from a, a paper by Neil Hindley in 2019. And you can see this big uh, red stream of, of activity around Antarctica. And then the, the figure above is actually from the reanalysis data, which again shows waves around Antarctica. But one thing to bear in mind is that every way we observe and model waves, these gravity waves, is they observe a different part of the spectrum. So what we're actually seeing is that, you know, these waves aren't well captured in some observations. We need to work through all different observations. But more importantly, for atmospheric models, they're not that well represented. We tend to use parameterizations purely because of the small scale. And this results in problems in some of the models, like a, a coal pole problem, where the temperature is a too cold compared to observations in, in the middle atmosphere. And also we're seeing things like late breakup of the polar vortex when you're running these models through. And all this is linked to this missing momentum that's in the models and they need to get the parameterization right. And all to improve parameterizations, we need to have more observations. So Anguin, what's our history? Well, we've been a SCAR action group now for, for four years, but we actually were kind of going before that. We we're kind of a grassroots organization. It started probably a good few years ago, sort of with initial collaborations between Americans and UK, where they were using um, something called airglow images. So airglow is a very faint, uh, thin layer of emission up in the middle atmosphere, about 87 kilometers up altitude. And it emits very sort of in the infrared radiation at nighttime. And as the gravity waves pass through this, um, they compress and rarefy the gas. And you see these stripes of sin in this, this image at the top there. And we had some of these images at Rothera uh, Station and Halley Station, which were both UK stations. And these were showing large amounts of gravity wave activity up in the middle atmosphere. So not just around the, the sea and the ocean, but we're seeing them over, over there as well. But then we kind of wonder, well, what's happening elsewhere? So as things progressed, we kind of spoke to lots of different other people at different conferences, and there's been a whole range of different airglow images. Other people were studying these as well. So we've linked up with other different nations. And we can see that, you know, we've now got a nice network across Antarctica, mainly around the edges, just to the nature of the of the, uh, the logistics in Antarctica, where we can actually get these observations from different sites. And this is allowing us to do continent wide studies of these mesospheric gravity waves using these air glow emissions. But it's now not just air glows. When we first started Anguin, it was mainly just air glow based. But now we're actually looking you know, we've got scientists joining us who use all different ranges of instrumentation. So we've got things like VLF, GPS, rheometers, which are kind of all looking more the ionospheric side of the atmosphere, higher up in the atmosphere. 
You've got noctilucent cloud cameras, you've got MF radars, meteor radars, which are always ground-based instruments. They're looking in the middle atmosphere. And noctilucent clouds are kind of uh, very, very cold ice crystal clouds up in the mesosphere. Um, we've got radio sons. You can get gravity wave information from radio sun profiles. And these are routinely launched from most Antarctic stations as part of their, their MET program. Um, then you've got things like the Pansy radar, which gives us uh, information on winds sort of in the lower atmosphere and in the middle atmosphere. And then, of course, we've got satellite inf uh, observations as well. I've just put Sabre there as an example, but MLS and various others, Cosmic, allow us to observe um, gravity waves over this region. The benefit of the ground-based system is that we've got a point location, so we can see seasonality at a given location. We can identify specific sources, where different, with satellites, they tend to have uh, only be covering the Antarctic regions and not necessarily all the high latitudes all the time. So that doesn't allow us to build up a proper picture of what's happening seasonally. So the advantage of using all the different instrumentation is that we can actually view different parts of the gravity wave spectrum. So we can we can actually build a picture of what the gravity waves are doing as a whole and use this to inform models. So what are our primary objectives? Well, we've got quite a few there. Um, I'll give our website at the end of, end of the talk. Um, but essentially, we're trying to understand what is the longitudinal variation. You saw in the previous slide our nice network around the, the edge of Antarctica. So it's trying to understand what's, what's ha happening in terms of the, uh, the gravity waves, how they're varying seasonally, um, what, how they're uh, affected by the polar vortex and things like that. We've also got the um, understanding of mountain waves, and this is kind of looking um, specifically down where there's mountain ranges, so down the peninsula region. Remember seeing this nice chain of, of images there, and there's also a good chain of radars there as well. So we actually understand what these mountain waves are doing and how they're, how they're affecting the, the stratosphere and the middle atmosphere. And then, as I'm not going to sit here and read them all out because I'll, I'll run over my time quite considerably. But you can see there's a lot of other um, objectives there that are kind of looking at the polar vortex and also linking with the modelers. That's something that's quite important because no point in us talking separately. We need to kind of work together to, to solve these, uh, these, these questions. So what are we doing as a network? Well, it's not just instrumentation in Antarctica. We've also been having community workshops. So we've had four international workshops so far, uh, Japan, USA, UK and Brazil. And it's bringing together gravity wave scientists and especially ECRs, early career scientists from different nations. And they've been really, really successful in fostering collaborations, generating papers, and also planning for future sort of programs, observations, and things like that. Since we became a, a, a SCAR action group, we've been fortunate enough that we've had a small budget, and that's enabled us to help e the early career researchers attend. Um, we feel it's very important for them to be have an opportunity to engage with like the senior scientists in the field, and they don't always have the travel budgets to get there. So we've been doing things like having free registration for our workshops, helping with travel funds, and also you know, for certain um, ECRs, they've had, we've had pots of money where they've been able to go to other major conferences other than SCAR or Angrim workshops to present Angrim related work. And this work has also led to, thank you, to ECR exchanges, sort of where we had like um, postdocs for um, students from other institutes visiting other ones for a few months at a time. And that's kind of really fostered collaborations. So sort of example of sort of things we've been doing, well, we've obviously, we've had the joint JGR uh, special issue on angry activities, and that's resulted in an article in EOS. We're actually putting together an instrument database because we've actually, you know, we've talked to people at conferences and realised they've had imager data or radar data, and we didn't know about it. So we've actually started to collate this and put that on our, our website to make it easier to foster collaborations. And also, we've got so much data now, we need to improve the way we do our analysis, and that's something that's come about is the M-Transform. Um, uh, so Kuji will be speaking about that later on today. So ongoing work and future, future uh, plans, where we've got several radars being improved over the next seasons. Obviously, we've been impacted by COVID with people not being able to go into the field, um, restricted access to various things. But this season is coming up is looking quite promising. We're having new instruments, a new LIDAR, new air glow cameras, and we're working together to come up with future coordinated observational campaigns. And lastly, I'm just going to leave that as an advert. So we've got our fifth workshop coming up this October. Um, it's going to be hosted by our colleagues in COPRI. Um, so there are, there'll be details going out on our Twitter and on our mailing list. If you wish to join our mailing list, um, please contact us through uh, either our Twitter handle or um, our contact details from the SCAR website. So I'll leave that there. Thank you very much. Excellent, Tracy. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we're, um, we're now into a question and answer session. Um, so uh, 
this is question, questions for the um, previous four talks. If anybody has any questions, um, you can either um, uh, type them into the Q and A, and um, and we can um, raise them that way, or um, you can raise your hand, and we will invite you to answer uh, to um, ask a question. So I will open the floor to uh, to questions. I might ask a question then. Put on your mark. Yeah. Um, uh, this one was for Suresh about the um, the citric acid and the, uh, what were the other ones? Sorry, I'm not a chemist. Cicinic and uh, glyoxyl. Um, I was wondering if, uh, I mean, obviously in, in sea spray aerosol, organics are a really sort of uh, important and not very well understood chemical species. Um, and you mentioned their role, potential role in CCN, cloud condensation nuclei, but I'm wondering if there's also a role that these complex organics have in ice nucleating particles. So I'm wondering if there's any work you've done on that. Suresh might not be here anymore, actually. Oh, he's not. All right. I'll have to go read his paper to see if there's an answer. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't see him in the um, attendee. So, um, yep. Um, does anybody else have any, any questions that they'd like to ask? So while, while people are thinking of questions, um, I might just remind you all that there are um, an array of um, really interesting um, posters um, that have been submitted to this session as well. Um, so if you go to the, to the virtual website um, and click on e-posters, you can see those. And, uh, um, and there's, a, there's a capability within uh, that website to ask questions of the, of the presenters of the posters and, uh, and you can um, and they will respond in um, uh, in due time um, uh, um, about the uh, uh, to any questions that you have. So, do we have any more any any more questions? We have some time available. Um, if anybody has any um, outstanding questions for the for some of the previous speakers too, we can probably um, take those as well. But Takashi, um, yes, uh, <clears throat> may I ask a question to Noe Pirlet? You made a talk about hydrological cycle and that. Yeah. Yeah, if you're here. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> actually, I didn't follow exactly what is the uh, moisture convergence so, and yeah. uh, P minus E is uh, <clears throat> normally it should be the same, but actually has little difference. How? Well, I, I, I didn't follow of your talk in the uh, first stage, so I'm not sure. Okay, uh, so you're, you're right. Um, was, basically, yeah. it's, it has to be the, the, the same, so P minus E uh, has to be equal to uh, the moisture convergence in a, in a column or a cell of a map. Yeah. But um, it's only the case when the uh, derivative of the precipitable water, if you remember the equation of the atmospheric water balance, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the right part um, is uh, the derivative over time of the precipitable water. It's, mm -hmm. and uh, P minus E is only equal 
to the moisture convergence when uh, there is an equilibrium uh, between the two. And at some times with the border, uh, there is uh, not the equilibrium um, between the two, but over a certain, a certain long time, there is the equilibrium. And um, in the first graph of the, about the time series um, at the seasonal scale, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the two curves are equals, uh, if you remember. Mm -hmm. So I hope uh, I answer your question. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I think we, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, so um, uh, I think perhaps we will um, uh, move on to the next um, set of talks. Um, uh, I think once again we have a full um, uh, a full um, group, so um, there will be no extra time in this case. So um, we need to stay close to time, and if we start a little bit early, maybe we that will cre create a few um, opportunities. Um, so um, uh, the first um, the first talk is uh, being given by um, uh, Valentin Bagaston. Was that Valentin? Um, so, uh, Valentin, um, if you can unmute and share your screen, and we can check to make sure that all is working. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Okay. And you can see the full screen? Yep, we can see the screen. Thank you very much. I'll give you a warning at, uh, um, at eight minutes, around eight minutes. Okay, thank you. So my name is José Valentín Magastón from Olympi, uh, and my work is uh, mesosphere graph waves and winds observation of your commandant Ferraz Antarctic Station and uh, updating the mesosphere lower thermosphere instrumentation and the recent results. These are our collaborators, uh, including uh, Dave Fritz and Wayne Hawking from United States and Canada, respectively. So uh, this presentation is structured in this uh, way. Uh, I show first the observation sites and motivations. They have vision the gravity waves observations in Ferraz and present the, the current gravity waves observation during this year. I uh, will present one or two uh, case. Uh, the meteor radar we gave it maintenance and uh, some example of the recent data and the future works to be done. So the observation site is the Brazilian Antarctic Station is located in the King George Island, uh, uh, northward of the Antarctic Peninsula. And here is the uh, new base of the Brazilian um, Brazilian Antarctic program. Uh, the observation site where we keep the instrumentation is uh, quite far from the main station. This is because the light contamination in the air glow image. So the um, refuge uh, needed to be uh, quite high from the station. And here you can see the meteor radar antennas and in the bottom, uh, the dome of the all sky image. So the main motivation for the studies on gravity waves is how these gravity waves uh, coupling the whole atmosphere from the troposphere up to the mesosphere and the atmosphere, including impacts in the ionosphere region. So uh, here you can see a similar uh, um, map uh, showed by Trace, uh, uh, where we see a large rock spot of gravity wave activity in the stratosphere, about 30 kilometer height. And in the bottom here, all sky image uh, observation from the OH air glow emission showing a uh, large structure of gravity waves in the mesosphere uh, near 90 kilometer of altitude. Also, the motivation is the Andrew Group that Tracy already told us about it. 
So uh, this group aims to get together um, uh, many data to understand better the gravity waves and it is impacting the atmosphere, including uh, general circulation and thermal effects in the upper and mid atmosphere. There are some examples of the data obtained at Halley, McMurray, and Ferraz. So this was the first instrument operated in Antarctica for to obtain all sky image of the OH and air glow emission. This was uh, operated in 2007, 2010, 11, and um, February, just a few images because it, there was an, uh, an accident or a fire accident in Ferraz. So it was uh, uh, take the, this instrument and uh, return to Brazil. So next we put another air glow camera, but a multi-filter camera. The previous system was uh, only single filter camera. So this system operated uh, and gave, gave good data from 2015 to 2017. Um, then the, the instrument have some problem because uh, nobody could go to Ferraz because they was rebuilding the station uh, in 2018, 2019. So uh, we called only return to Ferraz uh, this uh, previous summer, uh, southern summer in January, February 2022. And uh, I went there and put this uh, new all sky camera. Uh, so it's working at the moment. So here are the, the filter used in the several different years of operation of the Oil Sky Camera uh, and the number of uh, mesospheric events observed in Ferraz along all this year. So the most large um, number of events was observed between 2015 and 2017. This is part of the work of Gabriel Giong in his master thesis. He will present uh, today some uh, results on this data. So this is the current image uh, um, that is observed there. This is an animation of data from the, the first night of observation during this year. Uh, it was early in February um, 7. So we can see here, not very clear here, uh, gravity wave structure denoted by the red box. Um, this is the spectral analysis of this event. We can see clear here the two crisps of the wave event propagated to east. And the spectral analysis gave you the results on this wave for about um, 46 um, kilometers of horizontal wavelength, a period of about 20 minutes, and a phase speed of 38 meters per second. Another instrument uh, we uh, rearranging the, the Ferraz station is a photographical camera that can capture the nucleus and clouds uh, events in the mesosphere. So this is, uh, um, uh, you can see also waves in this structure um, and it could complement data from the all sky camera. This camera points to the horizon. Here we can see two pictures uh, took by a hand outside the, the container. And we can see clearly this event is uh, quite a hard. Uh, it is not common in, in Antarctica. And also the, the tropospheric cloud uh, coverage um, do not allow that we observe sometimes the nucleoscent cloud in the upper uh, atmosphere. Uh, this, uh, this event was also uh, seen by the all sky camera. We can see on the left, and uh, here's a, a short animation of this um, mesospheric clouds. And here's the same structure on the right side. So uh, I also analyzed this uh, event uh, by using the all sky image here in about uh, five images, sequential image 
and it is given um, that the, the cloud uh, is possible uh, modulated by uh, graphic waves with 38 kilometers of horizontal wavelength and a period of 70 minutes. Uh, and after that analysis in the same night, uh, just one hour uh, after that analysis, we can also see on the right side the bright uh, contamination by the, um, the nocturnes and clouds. This is um, another gravity waves propagating um, almost from north to south. And these waves were, uh, were seen in the air globe. And it can be seen that the wave is very similar structure, have a similar structure to the, that structure seen in the nocturnes and clouds. That is a horizontal wavelength of 38 kilometers, a period of about six minutes, and a very similar uh, horizontal speed. So we could infer that this wave is mod uh, modulate the nocturnes and clouds. Two minutes. Okay, so we pass to the meteor radar. The meteor radar is a system um, composed by 13 antennas, uh, five receiving and 18 transmitting antennas. Here's the um, electronic models that control the, the system. So we did uh, maintenance uh, uh, during the summer. We can see here the work outside the, the shelter. Here we were. Uh, was putting the antenna up here, that's a previous antenna, the broken one. He's fixing some, uh, the cable, contact cables of the antenna. Here's the, the, that broken one um, in the right position. So these are some examples of the meter radar data. So we can see the meter radar flux, it is working quite fine. This is the distribution in terms of altitude of the meteor, uh, the meteors in the upper mesosphere, lower thermosphere. The peak is around the nine kilometers. Here's an example of wind. So this system obtains wind from about eight kilometers to a uh, hundred kilometers. Um, the, the system operates in 36.9 megahertz. This example is from April 2006. Uh, April 2002, in, on the day 26, 26. This is the example I took yesterday. So we still have some some issues here, some problem we need to fix. Problem is due to one uh, receiving antenna that is not working um, good. So uh, in this next summer, we need to fix this antenna and then, uh, another ones. Uh, the system also can um, obtain the average uh, temperature in the, uh, the mesosphere region, the upper mesosphere region. This is another day of observation uh, yesterday. So the future works are the repairing of the transmitting antennas, and there are uh, eight transmitting, uh, transmitting antenna, and only four antennas is operating at this time, and the one uh, Receiving one needed to be um, also repaired. And other studies, uh, detailed studies on that event of nocturnal sand cloud and the graft wave in the same night in February, the last February, need to be go deep. And also perform some uh, look at the data to see if it, there are potential events in the ionosphere, um, such as traveling ionosphere disturbance or some events uh, related to the solar activity like auroral red arcs. Uh, that's it. And I need, I need to acknowledge the Antarctic Brazilian program and the, the Brazilian Navy base group that uh, operated the, the station uh, in Antarctica and they helped us uh, during the last summer. And also our financial support, CNPQ, FAPESP, NS, NSF from the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Lenton. That's um, very good. Um, if you could unshare your screen. So um, I'm 
I'm the next presenter, so I'm going to flip from being the, um, the host to being a presenter. So um, I will um, just share my screen and start talking. If someone um, would like to remind me when I get to eight minutes, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, I'll give you the eight minute warning. Thank you very much. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Yep, that's looking good. Go ahead. And you can hear me, that's good. So um, tonight, I'd, or today I'd like to talk to you about how Antarctic gravity wave observations can influence model parameterization improvements. This is some work that I'm doing with Ann Smith from uh, NCAR in, uh, in Boulder in Colorado. Um, just hang on, there we go. Um, model parameteriz parameterization schemes for, for gravity waves, um, for non-orographic gravity waves um, have a long history. Um, early observations of atmospheric waves showed, showed that their spectra has a universal form and many global climate models use that to simplify their parameterization um, of gravity waves. Um, an example we're given on the right is the Warner and McIntyre scheme from their paper in 2001. Um, this parameterization method uses um, vertical wave number as a dependent variable. Um, the source pseudo momentum flux spectra are modified by the background atmospheric conditions as the waves uh, essentially propagate up through the model and vertical gradients in the total momentum flux provide atmospheric um, forcing. Um, spectra of horizontal phase speed are also used in, uh, in parameterizations. Now these spectral parameterizations assume that enough gravity waves are propagating in similar directions um, within a grid cell to form a spectrum. Um, and they also assume the presence of a full range of gravity wave frequencies and wave numbers. So how good is this spectral assumption? We can check this with radio sonde observations um, similar to the ones that Tracy um, spoke about in her talk, um, because they provide a, um, a near instantaneous view of the gravity wave field. Now these um, radio sonde observations support the form of the Warner McIntyre um, spectrum uh, when numerous spectra are, are average. So this um, uh, top left um, uh, panel shows that um, uh, the average of a month worth of um, radio sonde um, spectra. Um, and that agrees fairly well with the Warner McIntyre form, but they don't support the concept that a single model grid cell at a single time contains a full spectrum of waves. Um, a parameterized spectrum sort of describes the, uh, the average state and therefore it doesn't really uh, respond to, to climate, uh, to long-term change such as climate change. So that's, that's a bit of a problem. And, an, and, a, and another question that arises is um, how can we constrain models with observations? It's something that we, uh, we are very keen to do um, uh, in the Anglin project. So once again, we can use radio sonde data to, um, to illustrate the difficulties um, in doing this. Um, uh, and we can do that because um, a radio sonde profile can provide a combination of um, U prime, V prime and T prime. So uh, wind variations and the temperature variation. And from that, you can obtain a momentum flux measurement. Now, we expect a disagreement between the observations and the model parameterization. Um, there's a, an example of, uh, of those, um, of such observations are given in, the, in that panel um, from, uh, from um, a, like a number of months of radio sonde observations. We expect them to disagree because the sondes are most sensitive to low intrinsic frequency waves. Um, this is a, a process that's um, termed instrumental filtering. The missing waves um, uh, carry large amounts of momentum flux. There are also source variations at the observing site um, uh, so that it's constantly changing um, the observed momentum flux, whereas the parameterized momentum flux is constant. So there's a temporal intermittency that's not captured in the parameterization. And finally, um, observations are not always made at the altitude or the location of the gravity wave source. So there's a spatial intermittency that's not captured in parameterizations. And they, these problems manifest themselves in various ways for all observing techniques. So um, it, it, it shows that, uh, that this is quite a difficult um, thing to do. So how can observations actually guide development? There are clearly shortcomings with the current um, non-orographic param um, parameterization schemes 
but insights from observations can actually um, guide model gravity wave parameterization development. For example, you can capture the spatial and temporal intermittency by noting that gravity waves are generated by fronts and jets and convective storms. And, um, uh, and by separating those mechanisms uh, in the model so that, uh, so that they, um, each, um, each of those um, produces its own gravity waves. And that's illustrated on the bottom left panel where the, the orange um, section shows that there's a front present and um, in Wacom, uh, which, is, which is where this comes from, um, where this change has already been made, um, the gravity waves, the frontal gravity waves are only launched from that area. Um, there is also um, uh, amplitude intermittency that needs to be considered. So super pressure balloon observations that have been taken uh, um, uh, in particular around Antarctica showed that a large proportion of the gravity wave momentum flux at 19 kilometers is carried by a small number of large amplitude waves. So, um, uh, and it turns out that the um, momentum flux distribution um, of those waves is log normal. Um, uh, the, the, the radar that we operate at Davis, which is once again part of the Angwin network, um, has verified that the same distribution is present near 86 kilometers in altitude. Um, so uh, quite a different altitude um, completely independent in, um, uh, observations, but they have um, uh, distributions that have the same form. So that's, uh, that's an interesting thing to note in um, uh, gravity wave parameterization design. So um, the Wacom model, um, which is the one that I, uh, I've been working on with Ann Smith, um, uh, we can use that as a test bed for some of the changes um, that I've described in, for, uh, relating to the concepts that I've just described. Um, previous changes have uh, separated the, the, the wave sources, but what I've uh, done recently um, in, recognition, in recognition of the role that large amplitude wave events play, but as also to provide a clear path from observations to model development, I've been testing Wacom with um, quasi monochromatic gravity waves um, uh, with fully specified wave parameters that, um, as sources. So these waves have the intrinsic frequency, the horizontal wavelength, the momentum flux, the propagation direction and the spatial and temporal extent of the wave packet all described um, specifically in the model. Uh, the amplitude variations can, um, can be described using a log normal distribution and I've changed the gravity wave saturations um, scheme so that uh, uh, it applies at all intrinsic frequencies using some Warner and McIntyre theory from a separate paper in 1996. Um, these, the panels on the right show the temperature um, profiles um, uh, from some of, my, some of those trials. So the top is standard Wacom, uh, the bottom is one of the trials. And you can see that um, the Southern polar mesosphere is warmer than the control. Um, and what that means is that we're not providing enough gravity wave forcing. So there's still something not quite right. Another assumption that is made in these parameterizations um, is that, um, that gravity waves um, are um, generated at the troposphere propagate up from there and saturate in the stratosphere and the mesosphere. That's something that uh, was um, proposed by Linzen in 1981. If we use gravity wave theory, then we can actually estimate gravity wave amplitudes at various two, heights. Two minutes left, Damien. Thank you. Um, for a given um, uh, um, momentum flux. So Wacom uses an moment, input momentum flux of 2.5 um, millipascals for each of, its, each of its waves. And um, using gravity wave theory, I calculate amplitudes of those um, of such waves um, up to a five hour intrinsic period. If you do that at the source, source height of about 500, at 500 hectopascals, then you get horizontal wind values between 10 and 65 centimetres per second, vertical wind values between three and five centimetres per second, and temperature variations up to 0.35 K. Now, when you consider that these waves are being launched near a, a, a big front, a big frontal system, then um, these values are actually quite small compared to the observations. You can repeat that at super pressure balloon heights. And the important thing here is that the super pressure balloon momentum fluxes all come out to be somewhat larger than the 2.5 millipascals that are being put in um, in the model. But then when you repeat that calculation in the mesosphere uh, at about 80 kilometres, you find that you get horizontal wind variations between 30 and 130 metres per second, vertical variations between 8 and 20 metres per second, and 
temperature variations between 10 and 55 um, uh, K, which are very, very large numbers and are not observed in that part of the atmosphere. So there's something about this assumption that doesn't seem quite right, that the, the idea that, um, that these waves of 2.5 millipascals are propagating all the way up to the mesosphere. Um, a concept, um, the concept of secondary gravity wave generation, where a gravity wave propagates up through the atmosphere, breaks, generates new gravity waves, and then those gravity waves propagate further up, is now gaining some acceptance. Um, some Anguin activities um, carried out by one of our colleagues, Masaru Kagure, um, and there's a couple of um, uh, references to, the, to where this work has been presented, um, provide operational uh, observational support for this idea of secondary gravity wave um, um, generation. So um, on the top right panel, the D2 um, area um, describes um, part of that um, phase speed spectrum that's been obtained from hydroxyl um, imager um, observations for that particular night in August. And what Masaru has done is um, taken uh, those waves and backtraced them down through the atmosphere. And what he finds is that those particular waves terminate at about 45 kilometres. So the ray tracing suggests that that's where they come from. And if you look at satellite data at those heights, you see that there is actually a large gravity wave um, present at those, at those heights. So these observations support the idea that the waves that uh, we're seeing in the imager data in the mesosphere are actually secondary gravity waves being generated by an interim process going on in the stratosphere. So what does that all mean? Um, the first generation of spectral gravity wave parameterization schemes advanced um, capability in models um, for middle atmosphere, um, but they, they, they have limitations and those limitations are becoming apparent. They don't represent the current knowledge of gravity wave generation and propagation. They rely on some intermittency factors that can't be fully, um, uh, fully measured because of um, uh, instrumental filtering effects and various things. Um, and the observations can't directly influence model development because um, the two are, are modally incompatible. Um, Parameterizations generally don't um, capture atmospheric change as well. Um, so the gravity wave processes prove to be very difficult to capture in, um, uh, in, in models and there's some ongoing biases. But the observations that we make in, uh, in Anguin can actually um, help with resolving the, these problems by, um, uh, by teaching us um, uh, the, um, about important parameterization design changes that we can make, such as the separation of, um, of the sources into, the, into gravity wave generation types, um, creation of a, of a path for observations to influence source gravity wave characteristics, inclusion of log normal amplitude distributions, and the parameterization of secondary gravity wave generation. And hopefully um, these changes, which are currently being, uh, being made to Wacom, uh, will enhance the agreement between model gravity wave representation and the observations. Thank you very much. So I will unshare. Um, I won't invite uh, any questions because um, uh, we're gonna do that later. And I'll go back into, um, into being um, uh, host mode. So the next talk um, is being given by, given by Professor um, Takuji Nakamura. Um, so um, Takuji, if you could unmute and share your screen. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, um, so if you can and share me, your screen and I'll give yeah. you a warning at, um, uh, at about um, uh, eight minutes. Okay. Um, so we can we can see your screen, but uh, it's is it full screen yeah, mode? It's now full screen now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Damian. Uh, the standardization of the data analysis is becoming the uh, common issue in SCAR community and also projects. And uh, in our ongoing action group, uh, it is also essen essential to have a common analysis uh, technique or method for a huge amount of data set collected in our network observation. Uh, therefore, we developed a uh, new analysis software to extract uh, gravity waves in air glow images. Also, this technique is useful in analyzing other types of uh, data such as ionospheric mapping data. Sorry, can I just interrupt? I think we are sharing your um... 
we're not sharing your main screen. We're sharing your screen that shows the the current slide and the next slide. Okay. Sort of working screen in. Is it okay that's now? That's correct. Yep. Very good. Oh, thank, thank you. you very much for. Okay. Uh, the gravity waves are important driver of, of atmospheric circulation in the middle atmosphere. Uh, and it transport energy and momentum upward uh, through the vertical propagation as introduced by uh, Tracy. The, the gravity waves generated by various sources uh, propagate vertically and also horizontally. And the horizontal propagation direction uh, is very important parameter uh, because it indicates the direction of momentum flux or in other words, the direction of the gravity wave drag. The horizontal phase velocity uh, of the gravity wave is uh, uh, studied by picking up the gravity wave event uh, like this. Uh, and the horizontal phase uh, velocity is important because the, it determines the uh, vertical propagation. Uh, the comparing with the background wind uh, profile, uh, we can estimate that uh, whether this wave is uh, uh, propagating throughout the atmosphere or the uh, hit the uh, critical level and uh, the breaks and uh, release horizontal momentum to the background uh, wind. Okay, however, uh, one problem uh, is that the, each uh, research group uses their own uh, method uh, for accepting gravity wave event. So the, uh, it was difficult uh, to compare the results from different groups uh, quantitatively. Another problem is the, that the uh, event analysis was uh, highly uh, manpower oriented and it is very time consuming to extract the gravity wave event from big amount of uh, aero images. So our group uh, has developed, developed the, uh, what we call uh, Matsuda uh, transform or M transform. This is the method to uh, obtain power spectral density of I prime of I uh, or uh, relative intensity perturbation in horizontal phase velocity domain. The core part of the uh, M transform is the three dimensional uh, discrete Fourier transform. The time series of 2D aero image in the geographic coordinate is Fourier transformed to uh, obtain K and L and omega uh, spectra and then convert it uh, to the phase velocity domain. You may see that the uh, uh, southwestward propagating uh, wave here uh, is uh, uh, indicated in this uh, phase velocity diagram uh, very nicely. The M transform uh, displays the energy and momentum of uh, transient gravity wave packet quantitatively, and uh, the spectral density here uh, represent uh, wave amplitude and the duration of wave event, and also the horizontal area of the wave packet. This slide shows the uh, example of the uh, spectrum observed by Showa Station. Uh, the upper panel shows the, uh, the uh, one day observation, May 3rd. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, spectrum shows the uh, westward uh, propagation uh, gravity wave is dominant. And the center uh, panel shows the uh, zonal million wind profile showing the eastward uh, wind uh, is prevailing. And uh, this corresponds to the, uh, the uh, blocking diagram uh, showing the uh, eastward propagating uh, gravity wave uh, in this black region is prohibited to propagate. And this uh, corresponds well with, with the, this uh, uh, spectrum. Okay, this M transform uh, analysis is applied to uh, simultaneous observation at four uh, stations uh, in Anguin uh, Imager Network uh, from phase velocity spectrum in April, uh, May uh, 2013. Uh, three stations, Showa and Hari and uh, McMado, showed the westward propagation is dominant, whereas the Davis uh, only showed the more omnidirectional uh, propagation direction without any specific direction. By integrating uh, this uh, phase velocity spectrum over uh, all the uh, phase speed, uh, total variance uh, of I prime over I uh, due to gravity wave can be uh, calculated. The right panel shows the uh, wave energy uh, is larger at Davis and Showa 
uh, by a factor of five or so uh, than Halley and uh, McMurdo, which is about uh, seven to nine degree uh, higher in latitude or close, closer to South Pole. Uh, the horizontal phase uh, velocity spectra of gravity waves are compared between three different uh, latitudes, Shigaraki, Japan, 35 degree north, Tomoho, Indonesia, the equator, and the uh, Showa station. Uh, the uh, three images had different uh, sampling time uh, from one minute to 5.5 minutes. Uh, but uh, uh, by accepting the uh, wave period range between uh, 16.5 to 60 minutes, it is possible to compare uh, the spectral density quantitatively, even though the cadence time is different. Uh, at Shigaraki, Japan, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the provocation direction was the uh, east southeastward, and uh, that in Showa Station is westward. And the uh, direction in equator, uh, Tomohon, was south uh, eastward. And uh, uh, you see the uh, <coughs> wind profiles uh, shows the uh, the at uh, the this two uh, stations, Showa and uh, Shigaraki, the wind filtering uh, causes the this difference. But uh, at uh, Tomohon, the wind is very weak, and uh, probably the uh, this distribution is caused by the uh, distribution of strong wave sources uh, in the tropical region. Uh, because time is limited, uh, I just show the uh, list of publication uh, used by used uh, M transform. Uh, the Kamen et al. Copley reported uh, the gravity wave uh, near Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, uh, this is a hot spot of a uh, gravity wave, and they reported seasonal variation, wind filtering, and uh, secondary wave generation. Our uh, colleague in Nagoya University he reported uh, both gravity waves uh, at uh, 95 degree high, uh, uh, kilometer height uh, by green line and uh, TID at uh, 200 kilometer height uh, by red line. and. Uh, uh, the, at various sites, uh, uh, at by various om omt measures, they reported the seasonal, uh, local time, and year-to-year uh, uh, -year variations uh, between the uh, several uh, observation sites. The name transform can be applied uh, to the uh, take total electron content mapping data obtained by GN GNSS. Two minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, GNSS uh, take map has a TC value at only very discrete uh, observation point compared with the normal air glow imaging. Uh, however, the time resolution is very high, uh, like uh, order of second. Pervita Sari uh, reported that uh, the uh, by applying the M transform to take map data uh, over United States. Uh, by average over uh, 17 kilometer times, 17 kilometer times, five minute uh, time and uh, special being. TIA pattern uh, moving as a planar uh, wave is analyzed uh, uh, for a wave period between 15 to 60 minutes. The two, two areas, uh, the western part and the eastern, eastern part of US, uh, the, uh, the compared to the uh, daytime, uh, the TIDs and also nighttime TID. M transform was also applied to SuperDAN uh, radar data. Uh, the SuperDAN radar provides 2D map of Doppler velocity uh, the, in the ionosphere. And Hazeyama et al. Uh, applied M transform to SuperDAN radar to Hokkaido or Japan. Uh, they clarified the local time uh, variation of TID and also solar cycle variation from one 11 year radar data. So to summarize, the uh, M transform uh, is a useful tool to analyze air glow imaging data quantitatively and easily without bias. Uh, M transform has been applied to many different uh, data set uh, in last five years. And M transform software uh, written in IDL is available at NIPL homepage.
and uh, we are happy to help uh, users of, uh, of M, M Transform. Okay. And this is the uh, list of uh, M Transform publications. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much, Takuji. That's um, an excellent talk. Um, and I can attest to the, uh, the you know, usefulness of the data. Um, okay, so the last talk for this, um, for this session has been given by Gabrielle Jongo. Um, so um, uh, Gabrielle, if you could, um, uh, you're clearly unmuted because I can hear you. So could you share your screen? And it uh, looks like the right screen and everything. So um, uh, please, um, please start and uh, I will um, uh, give you a, a call at uh, about eight minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Gabriel Jongo. I will present the gravity wave characteristics and propagation conditions in the mesosphere over Commandant Feraz Antarctic Station. Uh, so, an uh, outline of my presentation I will talk a little about the observation and methodology. And I present two parts of the results, one with the parameters of the graph waves, and the second part uh, with the horizontal and vertical propagation conditions. And I conclude in some uh, reference and acknowledgement. Uh, so the observations uh, were carried uh, with an ergo imager at the Commandant Ferraz Antarctic Station. It's in the King George Island in, near the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, we had three years of uh, consecutive uh, observations. And uh, here's an, uh, a photograph of the, the imager that in that years. Uh, here is in the protection dome. Uh, so uh, the air glow image obtained, uh, we can see the wave instructions uh, on it. And after the uh, corrections of the, the lens curvature and some uh, filtering process like the star removal, uh, we can finally uh, Extracted the wave parameters by applying a, a 2D uh, fast Fourier transform in the region of the image where uh, we see the, the wave. So uh, the, the parameters were uh, classified as the horizontal wavelength, the observed period, and the phase speed. Uh, here is the, the histograms of the parameters along the three years we identified 522 small scale waves uh, in the first column we see the horizontal wavelength it was distributed uh, mainly uh, between 20 and 35 kilometers uh, the periods uh, was distributed mainly in five to 20 minutes and phase speeds between uh, 20 and 80 meter per second. Uh, we see a, a similarity among, among the, the years uh, that shows the, the typical characteristics of these waves, uh, small scale waves in the studied region. Uh, we also calculate the intrinsic parameters uh, that could be made uh, with the uh, winds provided by a meteor radar uh, in the King Serong station. It's about uh, 30 kilometers uh, near the, the Commandant Ferraz station. And, and also for the estimation of the vertical wavelength, we was at the temperatures from the Sabre instrument. So we see uh, vertical wavelengths uh, mainly from 10 to, to 20 to 25 uh, kilometers. Uh, periods uh, is smaller than the, the observed. The, the intrinsic was concentrated more in between uh, five and 10 minutes. Uh, and the 
em três que fez speedwares é, were more distributed. We see the, the influence of the direction of the wind on the uh, about the, the horizontal propagation. Uh, we didn't, uh, we analyze it by superposing the the blocking diagrams with the uh, phase velocity vectors of the analyzed waves. Uh, we use it. Uh, average monthly average wind, wind during the three years of uh, observations. Uh, you will see here the, the blocking diagrams. Uh, the, ma the majority of the waves were propagating uh, in a different direction of the wind. And the ones uh, with component parallel to the wind, it, it had, it had uh, a, a, a large velocity. Uh, the directional aspect of the waves have larger agreements with the wind filtering indicated by the blocking ring. As you can see, the, uh, if there was slower waves uh, propagating in the same direction of the wind, uh, mostly eastward along the winter, the, it probably uh, break it in the middle atmosphere. Uh, the vertical propagation was uh, analyzed by the squared vertical wave number profile in the region between 80 and 100 kilometers. Uh, we used also the, the radar, the near radar winds and the, the saber. Uh, as the saber has a, a limitation, in, a cover limitation in the uh, polar region, uh, only 380 waves were analyzed, and we see we saw a, a majority of the waves identified as propagating, about 80 percent. Uh, this is an example of the uh, squared vertical. Uh, wave number profile, it's positive, the, the, the wave is classified as propagating. Uh, only 20 duct, uh, waves were ducted and 44 waves was observed with uh, a open duct. Uh, and no, no, no case of uh, evanescent wave uh, could, could be identified. The, other observations over Antarctic also have showed similar results. Uh, that's a, a majority of the waves as propagate. Uh, we also saw uh, a, a certain number of uh, waves with a, a critical level near it. Uh, that's a, an example, the, the vertical wave number goes to infinite as the the wave uh, the, the phase uh, speed of the wave is equal to the wind in that direction then uh, th 38 waves were observed in a dissipation condition critical level is just about the altitude of the observation nominally 86 kilometer uh, and also, it's uh, observed critical levels uh, below the, the hydroxyvergo layer. It means that the wave should not be observed. So we suppose that uh, such waves can be secondary waves generate lo locally, uh, just below the Dergo hydroxyl layer. Uh, this, this wave could, uh, should be classified as propagating, but uh, we see that uh, it is also affected by the wind shear near the mesos mesopausal region. Uh, so uh, the wave propagation directions can be changed as well as their parameters.
So the, the conclusion is uh, more than 500 monochromatic graph waves were investigated at the Commandant Ferraz Brazilian Station. Uh, the results in the, para, in, in the graph waves parameters is, are, are in agreement with previous work supported for Antarctic Peninsula. A large number of vertically propagating waves uh, were observed and also 20% uh, of the waves were associated with critical lefts, potentially caused by wind shear uh, close to the airglow layer. Uh, wind filtering plays an important role in the gravitational vertical propagation. Uh, as we saw in the blocking diagrams, uh, the results also agreed with previous study carried around the, the Antarctic. Uh, so some references and my thanks to SCAR, to my professors in the postgraduate program and uh, for thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabriel. I'm sorry I didn't give you a time warning. I was um, looking too intently at one of your diagrams. So I, I lost track of time, but fortunately you finished on time. Thank you very much for that. Thanks. So um, that's the last um, the last talk in this um, uh, in this block, and um, uh, we can now um, open up for questions. So um, if anybody has any questions, your options are to um, type them in the Q and A or raise your hand, and uh, and we can. Um, uh, we can then uh, um, uh, get you on board to ask a question. Um, well, I can um, I can ask a question if uh, if that's if that's okay. Um, oh, sorry, no, Takuji, you have a question. Um, so you are able to talk, where, where you go? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah, the, go ahead, please. All right, so I should ask my question. Pardon? Um, the, yeah, I, 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 yeah I, you should be first and I, I will be the second. <laughs> okay. okay, so my question is for Tracy, um, uh, and it's a bit of a sort of a, um, uh, you know, um, blue sky question. So um, we, um, you describe the Angwin network and it's um, quite extensive. Um, if we um, uh, had the opportunity to add stations or, um, uh, or various um, capabilities to our Angwin network, do you have any thoughts on, on where, um, you know, what characteristics they would be? Like, um, are there, you know, um, is our latitudinal um, uh, coverage good? You know, are there um, particular instruments that you think we're short of? You, would you like to comment on that? Nice open-ended question. Thank you, Damien. Um, well, it's hard. I mean, we're kind of limited to where the bases are. I mean, I did do an exploration kind of looking at whether we could automate the Ergo uh, images, because then we could just leave them running and fill in the gaps, basically. Um, obviously, we're kind of limited to where the, where the stations are. I think it's nice to have stations where you've got different instruments, so you can kind of fill in the gaps, both in terms of altitude range and also observational um, characteristics. Um, it's, it's quite a nice um, set now along the peninsula, which is really nice to see because you've actually got the, that's where one of the hot spots of the gravity waves are. So we can kind of see um, sort of overlapping sort of fields, almost overlapping fields of view up as we go up the peninsula. Um, so a couple more to fill in the gaps there, be really nice to kind of understand the, the effect of mountain waves and, and, and the like in the mesosphere. Um, yeah, I think it's just a lot of, it's just more sort of making sure that everyone's aware we can share data and some, countries it's quite hard to find who's got hold of the data and who's contact if you want to use some information from their site and there's some information on the com map um, web pages where every country lists their station and what instruments they've got there but every country does that differently and with different levels of, uh, of granularity so some you just get basic oh there's a met instrument but that gives us no information so it's more a case of like uh, reaching out to people at conferences so we can actually see what data is there. Then we've got a better picture of what, what's available and kind of work and collaborate. I mean, in the UK, there's been a couple of good schemes where we've had links with other national programs where we can apply for money. 
So we've had stuff with Brazil, we've had stuff with um, you know, NSF in the States. So that's encouraging our national programs as well to kind of be involved in those, because they offer so many opportunities for us to work together with other nations, which is what it's about really. I hope that kind of answers, that's kind of a rambly answer. No, that's excellent, thank you. Um, so um, I'll throw to Takuji, um, you have a question? Yes, uh, I have a question to uh, Gabriel, the last talk. Uh, so you showed the, uh, the slide uh, before the uh, last slide, uh, the, uh, in the case of the profile, uh, the uh, hit uh, critical level with, uh, under the uh, ergo layer. And uh, so the, you uh, the, uh, suggested this is the secondary gra gravity wave. And uh, also you showed that in the uh, conclusion, 20% uh, or something. So you, you mean the, uh, you observed 20% uh, of the uh, total sample uh, showing the uh, seems like a, a secondary wave, is it right? Yes, 20% of the propagating waves uh, were also uh, so with the critical levels uh, near it. It's about okay, yeah. 15 percent with uh, a critical level uh, above the, the observation layer and uh, five percent with the waves uh, with the critical level below. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? No, no, I, I am uh, looking for how to <laughs> uh, <laughs> down my hand. Uh, there's a raised hand at the bottom. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I have I have a question for Valentin. I'd like to clarify. So, um, um, Valentin, are you, are you there? Um, oh, yes. There um, so you showed some meteor radar observations. Were they from um, from um, your station or from King Sejong? No, it is from our station. It's from oh, okay. Sejong station. Right. Yeah, this is the radar uh, installed in 2010 in cooperation with Dave Fritz from Gatsing Department from Boulder. Ah, cool. But the radar stayed unoperated after the fire till the last year. So uh, the previous data now in the last year, in this current year, I think is not so good because the antennas are not fully recovered. But this year I could recover some ones, including almost all the, the receiving ones and are giving a reasonable, uh, a good data and, and uh, Wayne Rocking suggests that we can use it two hours average of the winds and not only one hour, so we can get more meteors in during two hours, and the winds would be more um, more propitious to describe the average state in the upper mesosphere. We could see the uh, the winds sometimes uh, present some gaps. You no. Know? Probably this is due to the uh, two uh, receiving antennas that is not working properly. So when I, when, I, intended, um... to, I, I intended to compare these winds uh, that are obtained this year with the Kingston uh, meteor radar to check if the average winds are similar. So um, do you think there's any possibility um, for um, extracting some of the other um, variance parameters and that sort of thing from the, um, from the meteor data um, using the techniques of what, that Wayne Hocking has, um, uh, has developed? Uh, I remember one uh, postdoctor uh, at EMP uh, working with a meteor radar and estimated the uh, um, gravity wave fluxes uh, based on the horizontal winds, but this radar at Ferraz already gave, gave you the, the, the flux, the gravity wave flux uh, supposedly uh, generated by gravity waves uh, in the winds. So this is an output parameter already set in that radar. 
uh, we could uh, ask you to Wayne Hawking to send us or uh, made available in the in the local computer, and I can access the local computer and uh, check the uh, availability of this data. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so, I will see. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? There's no um, no questions on the Q and A, and um, no one has their hands up. Um, I'll ask. I'll ask Mark, one very Mark simple. has a question. Good on you. Very simple. Uh, non gravity wave pers person question for uh, uh, Jose. Um, uh, I was wondering with the detection of the noctilucent clouds uh, from the camera. Is that just done manually, or do you have some automated or deep learning approach to identifying? when you have noctilucent clouds uh, the we have a, a automatic uh, software to take pictures and uh, just after the sunset the camera started to take photos mm -hmm. uh, and automatically during all the night uh, but the this last summer i was there in the local site and as i set the all sky camera for air glow images I took out the, the photographical camera from the dome and put it over a table and it was uh, working outside. So I see directly the Noctilus and Cloud. So I take I took the camera from inside and manual uh, took the photos. Mm -hmm. After that, I I set the camera inside the, the shelter and put in the on a window. So now we set it to automatically uh, take picture. But mm -hmm. the problem there is the large coverage of the tropospheric clouds during the summer. This is the main problem. <laughs> okay. So maybe there is a deep okay. learning approach that could be useful for identifying when you've got these noctilucent and not tropospheric clouds. Yeah, this would be a, a good a good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Thank you. All right, well, I think um, it's time to um, draw this session to a close. Um, thank you everybody for your um, participation and um, I hope you um, hope you have enjoyed the variety of talks that we've seen and the and the quality of the presentations. Um, uh, I'll just note that the um, uh, the recording is going to be um, put up uh, on the SCAR YouTube channel. If you do not wish your talks to be um, put up, then you can contact the conference organizers and they will um, uh, um, remove your talks from, from that process. But uh, otherwise the talks will become available um, uh, for, um, for people to see or for you to um, uh, re reference and, uh, and, and have other people see your talks that uh, weren't present tonight. Um, I don't, um, so perhaps I'll, um, I'm not sure, um, Yamanuchi-san, do you have any, um, any final comments you'd like to make? No, exactly no. <clears throat> no comments, but uh, thank you very much for all conveners and uh, presenters and uh, also audience. <clears throat> and I especially thank you for, for conveners and especially Damien works very hard to finalize the uh, last uh, program and so on. So anyway, thank you very much, and uh, we have enjoyed this session. And please don't forget to visit the uh, poster session also. So see, see you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Shall we end the session? Yes, please. Yes, ready to end the session. <laughs>